And I'm going to repeat that again because people were, were joining here, joining the broadcast. So welcome, everyone. My name is Gemma Nelson, um, and welcome to our class on data science. We're going to be uh, working this morning. Uh, this, uh, this is going to be the schedule for today, this first morning session. We're going to be talking about what data science is, defining it. We'll have a midday break from 12.30 to 1.30 East Coast time. And then in the afternoon, we'll be doing a little bit of a deeper dive into the techniques, getting a little bit more technical, talking about uh, some of the vocabulary and uh, the detailed techniques of how these, how machine learning, how artificial intelligence is uh, accomplished. Okay. So that's how we're going to proceed today. If you want to um, uh, participate, have just a paper and pen handy. We'll have some little thought exercises as we go along. So um, just, you know, grab a piece of paper and a pen and we'll get underway here in just a minute. Uh, I'm uh, just to let you know a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Gemma Nelson. I'm a biostatistician by training. Um, before that, I did some web development uh, in the educational arena. Uh, I teach R and Python and SAS. Uh, pretty regularly, teach topics in data science, machine learning, uh, in artificial intelligence, deep learning, um, all that good stuff uh, for lots of companies in North America. So that's kind of my background. I'm going to be come on and off video here, so sometimes I'll be on video, sometimes I'll just be a voice speaking to you from beyond. And let's get underway here and start talking about what this data science thing is. So what we're going to do here is start off by talking about a definition of data science. Defining that term, trying to describe who a data scientist is, trying to describe the data scientist's typical activities, and review some of the typical data science projects. Um, we'll also uh, look, uh, as we get through this, we'll sort of look and see how data science fits into an organization, the different roles that data science plays and, and the other kinds of people that data scientists work with. And then, like we said in the afternoon, uh, it's going to be a deeper dive into some of those techniques, those uh, algorithms, machine learning, supervised versus unsupervised learning, all of that good stuff. So what is uh, data science? It's a new discipline. It's emerged recently. We can say over the last uh, five to 10 years or so. It's emerged in response to the challenges of analyzing big data. And of course, that brings uh, along another question which, with it, what is big data? We'll uh, take a little aside here and think about that as well in just a bit. But we're all pretty conversant. We understand that we're dealing with more and more data every day, right? Our, our richness of data has just exploded in recent years. We're capturing more data. We're looking at more data and we want to analyze that data. And it's yielded really great insights. And so there's more and more people uh, who are doing these kinds of tasks. Data science focuses on the extraction of knowledge and business insights from data. It does so by leveraging the techniques and theories from many applied and pure science fields. So the data science person, the person who's a data science may be a statistician. Um, they may be someone who's studied pattern recognition, machine learning, computer science, data warehousing, data visualization, scalable and high performance computing, all these kinds of disciplines can be part of the data science field. Now, as you learn about the field, you'll be encountering a lot of vocabulary. 
So we're going to try and take you through some of that vocabulary here and talk to you about what it means. Now, uh, some of these definitions move around a little bit. So these aren't always set. We're going to give you our best definitions here, but realize that some people may define these in different ways. Machine learning is probably something you've heard about. That's a subset of data science or statistics or computer science that uses existing data to train algorithms to either make predictions or take actions on new, never before seen data. So you have some past data, you're gonna train an algorithm on it and we're gonna talk about what that algorithm means. We'll actually be looking at several of them in sort of part two this afternoon. Those algorithms will try to learn from the data that you have and then make predictions on future unseen data. That existing data that you already have, that old data, the past data, might be labeled data. So it might be data where you have, it's already been classified by humans. Um, what that means is someone's gone in and said, this is our outcome, this is our sale, yes or no. This is someone who's purchased, a customer who's uh, retained or dropped, something like that or it might be unlabeled data, where you don't have a label, you don't have a target. We'll get into that in more detail in the afternoon session. <clears throat> Machine learning is also sometimes referred to as data mining or predictive analytics. And again, many of these definitions, they're still evolving, they're, they're still changing. So it doesn't hurt to ask someone when they say a term, predictive analytics, data mining, what do they mean exactly by it? Are they talking about machine learning? Are they talking about regression techniques or classical statistics? Many of the, these things overlaps and we're just trying to evolve our knowledge as the field evolves as well. So as we mentioned, data science includes, in addition to machine learning statistics, advanced data analysis, data visualization, data engineering, and more. Artificial intelligence, which is also referred to as deep learning, aims at automating or augmenting or substituting complex human activities through a number of specialized computer-assisted solutions. You've probably heard artificial intelligence as a buzzword. It's something that's very much in the news, has been very much in the news recently. We use it every day and we actually are surrounded uh, by it every day. So when you have a uh, movie website that recommends movies to you, uh, if you've been in a self-driving car, many of those solutions are based on deep learning through neural networks using artificial intelligence. It's something that actually has been around for a long time but it's experienced a resurgence of blossoming in the current age. And there's been a lot of breakthroughs and you're probably already using it. You may not realize it, but it's surrounding you in many of the products that you're using. When you're working with data, there are several data related roles um, that are highly interconnected. So these are the, some of the roles that you might hear about or that you might have in your organization. A data scientist. And again, these, these roles, these rules can be flexible here, but generally uh, this is uh, the understanding of the, these roles and how they pertain to uh, the actions that people in these roles take. A data scientist is someone who uses existing data to perhaps train machine learning algorithms to make predictions, to generalize or take actions on unseen data. They often uh, apply scientific experimentation techniques when working with data to try out different machine learning models. They might do sensitivity analyses where they see what is the result of including something in a model, not including it in a model. We'll talk about models again in part two, what we mean by modeling that can 
itself encompass quite a wide range of techniques. Distinct from that, we often define a data analyst as someone who uses traditional business intelligence BI tools to understand, describe, categorize, and report on existing data. So someone who's mainly looking at exploratory data techniques, summary statistics, observed data, this is someone who might be classified more as a data analyst. A data engineer is someone who mostly deals with extraction, transformation, and loading of data. So perhaps someone who is more concerned with the way data is stored, the way it is retrieved from that storage, and who supports the above roles with their data prowess. So here's a visual of the data science ecosystem. Again, these are some of the disciplines here that fall under the rubric of data science. So mathematics, classical statistics, advanced computing, computer science, visualization, domain expertise, data engineering, an understanding of the scientific method, and a willingness to experiment or play around or have curiosity, something like a hacker mindset as well. These all contribute to what makes a good data scientist. Now, a data scientist can use many different tools. And indeed, we, we often use several different kinds of tools different kinds of software packages, visualization packages, have familiarity with different kinds of databases. This is all part of the role here. So some of the tools that are popular right now is the Python language. This is an open source language that was first released in the 90s. It's been around for a long time, uh, but it's a general purpose programming language. But the data science tools have evolved over the last 15 years or so to become very strong and very popular within the data science ecosystem. Some of those packages on the Python side that you might have heard of include Scikit-learn. This is a machine learning toolkit, free and open source and very powerful. NumPy, which stands for numerical Python, this is a, a mathematical and algebra-based library in Python. The pandas package. This is a very popular, very important package in Python. Uh, this is the package in Python that gives us a rectangular container for our data, something like a spreadsheet. Uh, the name there, pandas, it's a funny name, but it actually stands for panels, data frames, and series sort of an acronym there. It's a very popular package, very influential on other packages throughout the Python world. So it's really a key package to learn about if you're interested in accomplishing data analytics with Python. Matplotlib is a visualization library as is Seaborn. We'll see a, a couple of these in some demonstrations uh, later in the morning and in the afternoon. One of the most popular development tools in the Python ecosystem are Jupyter Notebooks. This is a shareable web app based platform that allows you to uh, mix markdown with code cells and share reproducible research. I'll show an example of that in just a moment. We'll look at what these Jupyter Notebooks look like. Another popular uh, tool here is the Apache Spark Scalable Platform. This is for big data analytics. You can interface with Spark through several different programming languages, through Python, through Scala, through Java. It has its own machine learning module or machine learning toolkit bundled within it. Spark is actually a um, <clears throat> It's a data storage platform. So it's a way to have big data stored in many different places on a cluster of computers. And it's how to 
retrieve those, that data from those many clusters of computers as well. To work with Spark, you become familiar with the Spark shell and also you do it through Jupyter Notebooks. So you can see Jupyter Notebooks popping up in a couple of different places here. There's also the R statistical programming language. That's another open source language that was developed in the 90s, also very popular. R is really unique in that it was developed exclusively to do analytics and statistics. It's different from all other languages in that respect, all other programming languages in that respect. And then more recently, you might uh, also have heard of uh, TensorFlow and higher level APIs called Keras and PyTorch. There's a question here of advantages of using Spark over Hadoop. Spark is a little bit easier to use and it's a bit more modern platform than Hadoop. It sort of sits on top of Hadoop and PySpark in particular gives you a nice interface into using Spark, using this architecture that you have in order to do all the manipulations that you need for your data. Hadoop is great, it works very well, it's a solid architecture, um, but it's showing its age a little bit here. That's my opinion, so other people can disagree with me. Um, but uh, Spark, and in particular PySpark, gives you a sort of modern interface into that. The latest versions of PySpark actually give you a data frame container which is based on that pandas library. So who is a data scientist? A data scientist is a professional working in the field of data science. As a job title, it has become more popular recently. And again, as we saw earlier, it requires a diverse range of skills in various areas, more so than those of the data or business analyst. So it's generally understood, and again, this is not a set in stone. People define data science in different uh, ways. Um, when you're looking at uh, people who have data science experience or people who are looking to gain data science experience, they can have some or all of these skills. But generally, practitioners in this field should have some practical training in statistics and machine learning, some kind of applied experience with them, good programming skills in some kind of language. R and Python are very popular ones. Uh, many students who are merging from universities now are coming with experience in R or Python from many different disciplines. hands-on experience with scalable computation. So uh, some understanding of big data, databases, how to, uh, how to address the kinds of uh, situations that arise when you're dealing with big data. We'll talk about big data here as an aside in just a moment and why it's so different. Python and R, because they were released quite a Quite a while ago in the 90s we had a different idea of the size of data and what comprised big data then. Both of those languages deal primarily with uh, data sets that fit into memory, so fit into, fit into RAM here. And as you can imagine, the scale of data that we're working with now often doesn't fit into memory so that's why we have a variety of solutions, big data solutions that can address those kinds of challenges. <laughs> Question here is, is a data scientist a fancy term for a data analyst? It depends. You're gonna hear me say that phrase a lot. Um, as a statistician, my training, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna fall back on that, that phrase quite a bit here, it depends. I don't think so. I think that people have a different understanding of what a data analyst does versus a data scientist. Uh, it's a different set of skills that we're trying to define right here. Data analysts generally have, there is some overlap of course, but data analysts generally don't have the kind of modeling, uh, machine learning 
statistical background, maybe, that a data scientist may have. The data scientist also has generally uh, more experience in computer science or computational approaches. A crucial part of the role is the ability to communicate with a variety of non-technical stakeholders. So we'll talk about that. You're gonna be, if you're working with data scientists or you're hoping to become a data scientist, um, all of this sounds very technical. It sounds very complex. We're gonna see a lot of vocabulary down below. But in the end, you're gonna to have to communicate the results of whatever question you're asking, whatever investigation you're doing to people who are non-technical. And that's a really crucial part of the role as well. A Couple of examples of data scientists. Uh, these are sort of famous historical examples. Jeff Hammerbacher built the data team at Facebook. He described the work done by their data science group as on any given day, a team member could author a multi-stage processing pipeline in Python, design a hypothesis test, perform a regression analysis over data samples with R, design and implement an algorithm for some data intensive product or service in Hadoop, and communicate the results of our analysis to other members of the organization. That's a pretty high bar. Not everyone necessarily has both Python and R experience, um, but it's not uncommon either. Some other tasks that data scientists perform. They work with businesses to understand the problem at hand. And if you're coming from this from a management perspective, we're going to talk here a little bit about how you know your business best and your expertise and how can you, you can leverage that expertise in working with a data scientist or eventually becoming a data scientist. Data scientists clean up and prime data. They remove data noise. They trim off outliers. They remove non-actionable data. That data wrangling or cleaning process can be quite a large part of the workload. That can be surprising, we'll talk about that, but that can actually take up quite a bit of time. Data scientists decide on what kind of statistical or machine learning model to use. So this is a key part of the role here, understanding what approach is appropriate and valid and will give you good results. And then implementing that approach, actually training the models, for building them, verifying and diagnosing those models, validating that model with the business, and then working with software engineers to productionalize or convert that model into a practical application. So you do all this work, you're trying to make some predictive analytic model, you then want to implement it somehow, or your business probably wants to implement it. That might be in terms of a web app, that might be in terms of some other kind of application that takes the inputs to the model, generates predictions, and can then act on them in some way. Here are a couple of other examples of data science projects, building correlation models based on user requests, searches, product reviews, predict users' choices. So recommender engines, which again, you've probably already used if you've engaged with a, a shopping website or a movie browsing website or a, um, a music website. You've probably had suggestions pushed to you. Uh, engaging in user data in a feedback loop in which it contributes to improving the company's products and services. So looking at reviews, looking at social media or tweets, analyzing it in a variety of different ways to improve customer experience. Developing a new customer segmentation model for the marketing department.
So uh, looking at your customers and trying to decide if they fall into certain clusters. Sentiment analysis, again, tracking uh, user input, social media, and then reacting to that. Fraud detection, looking at transactions, making predictions on what might be fraudulent or anomalous transactions. These are all examples of data science projects that are in use every day. One of the facets of data science, one of the parts of it here, is to identify the data aspect of user activities. Now, we tend to think right now that we have lots and lots of data, and that's true. But the question that always uh, follows us is, do we have the right data? Do we have good data? And we're going to think about this as an exercise here in a bit. In some cases, a separate data product needs to be developed that would help gain insight into user activities. And this is a, actually a very common situation. Data is collected for different reasons. And even though you might have a lot of data, it might not be the right data. So an early data product on the web here was the CDDB, uh, CD database, uh, built by Gracenote for the task of identifying CDs. The original audio compact disc format didn't include metadata about the compact disc. It didn't have the, the disc name, the track titles, performing artists, et cetera. Gracenote developed a digital fingerprint of the compact disc, um, which could then be used to index the metadata stored in the uh, online database. Once that data product was in place, a whole range of usage and business analytics could be performed by using it. Think also of web page analytics, right? How those are collected and what can be done with those kinds of web page analytics to track users as they're moving across a company website. In the beginning, we just had raw web pages. We didn't include that kind of tracking. Um, but now that we have it, there's a lot that we can do with it in terms of making discoveries about how long our user lingers on a page, what they're interested in, how they follow through a particular website. Another example here is Google's PageRank algorithm. That was among the first to rank websites in their search engine based on the number and quality of links pointing to a page. Google built their infrastructure around that concept. And sometimes uh, when you have the data, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you make fortuitous discoveries that you've collected data that you can repurpose for some other usage. So during the swine flu epidemic of 2009, Google used search data to predict flu trends around the world. Google identified a correlation between how many people search for flu-related topics and how many people actually have flu symptoms. As a contemporary example of this, you might have noticed in the news articles about people's movement based on cell phone data. So there are databases that anonymize uh, cell phone tracking and uh, independent journalists can look at those and uh, a data scientists can make visualizations and analyze uh, how people are moving around these days. Are they moving around more or less than they were last week? And it can be a very interesting analysis based on that cell phone location data. There are some gotchas or some traps with data science not understanding the nature of the data at hand, not filtering out uh, information noise inside the data, or falling prey to the garbage in, garbage out principle. If you don't have good data, you're not going to get good results. I think one of the most common misconceptions about data science and predictive analytics is that you have a bunch of data, you're going to train an algorithm on it, and you're 
automatically going to get predictions. That's not necessarily true. If there's nothing predictive in the data, you will not be able to predict on it. So you may have a lot of data, but if the data you've collected doesn't actually correlate, doesn't predict with the outcome you're looking at, let's say how much money your customers are spending, then that data set isn't gonna be able to make those predictions. Seems kind of simple, but we often forget about that. Just because we have a lot of data doesn't mean it's necessarily good data. Another trap here can be going too deep on the statistical side of things. As a statistician, we try to balance model capacity or complexity with what we call model parsimony, the simplest model, the most elegant model. Sometimes simple models, they may not predict as well, but they may be more explainable, they may be more appropriate, and they may be more effective. So sometimes we can make a, a big, huge, complicated model, but it's actually the simple linear model that may predict best for us or give us the best understanding of the situation at hand. And we're going to look at a couple of those here in a demonstration in just a bit. Not seeing the big picture. Well, this is true in any business sense, right? Not seeing the forest for the trees. So getting lost in the details of an analytic approach and forgetting about what the driving question is. And again, that crucial part of communication challenges with business and other stakeholders, not doing the right thing or not validating intermediate results with business early in the project. So again, it's very common to uh, launch a complex statistical project, but expertise is really important. And as you're analyzing uh, a particular product as you're going through and building a model, you really want to meet frequently with experts in the field to understand if your approach makes sense and has actionable items in it. So we talked about what data science is. We compared data mining with the emerging data science. We defined who a data science is and a data scientist's typical activities. And we talked about some of these gotchas in here. I'm going to switch gears now and show you a uh, sort of the, the preparatory steps of beginning a data science project. So this is a demo and we'll be working through it today. And we just have a fictional company data in here. And we're going to be examining it in different ways. We're going to be using, uh, to begin with, uh, a straightforward statistical technique called linear regression. Later in the afternoon, we'll do some machine learning on it. And again, this is pretty simple data here. The idea is just to go through an example of a typical data science workflow, simplified uh, for the time that we have available. So what we want to talk about here are the steps to go through a data science project. Defining a high value question, bringing in data, data wrangling, exploratory data analysis, data visualization, modeling, and communicating results. And this is what the second part of our uh, morning is going to be here. The, those, that next uh, chapter in the PDF there is going to be talking about these stages as well. What I'm showing you right now is a Jupyter Notebook. So again, this is a web app that launches inside of a web browser. This is running on my laptop. It looks like an application. I've got menus here. I've got some buttons I can run. The page down below is written in what we call markdown format. So this is a simplified formatting language. It looks like this if I uh, click on it and sort of look at the hood of it. This is how we define things in markdown format. And this Jupyter Notebook mixes this markdown format, the simple formatting, with code cells 
that can be uh, commonly Python, but can be other languages as well. The idea with Markdown here is you have a restricted vocabulary that defines basic formatting options for you. So this specifies a two-level header. You can see I have an unordered list below. The reason for that being you don't have all the options like you would in a, uh, a document editor here that you focus on your writing and not on the formatting of the writing. But again, this is a very popular format for sharing uh, reproducible research uh, across uh, academia, across scientific investigation in machine learning and data analytics. Here's an example of a code cell. So this cell actually represents Python code. This code, and I'm not going to worry too much about the code here. I'm not, not going to uh, worry that about, uh, worry you with that here. I just want to show you what it looks like so you have familiarity with it. Uh, this is Python code that's existing in a code cell, and we can run this code and get results. Now, this particular code right here isn't doing too much. It's just importing a bunch of packages that we use later in the analysis. So some extra bits of functionality that we need to actually do the analytics down below. But that's how we can blend this writing and the code together here. I'm going to run a couple more of these cells. This is the way we typically set up a, a data science project. And then we'll start to talk about the data science workflow here. We'll take a break here in about 20 minutes. So just another 20 minutes or so, and we'll take our first short little break of the morning. We're going to talk about this data science workflow and the second part of our materials are going to go through this as well. This is another overview of the data science workflow. This is taken from an R book, R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grohlman. And this is a really nice visualization of what we try to keep in mind as data scientists. These are the basic tasks and stages of the project that we go through. Importing data, bringing it in. Sometimes step one is much more difficult than it sounds. Tidying or wrangling or cleaning the data. We mentioned those activities uh, earlier. That can take up a large portion, a large percentage of the work here. Even though it's just a little word there in the workflow, that actually can take up quite a bit of time. Then we move into a central loop here of understanding our data. And in that understanding, we transform data, we visualize it, and we model the data. That sometimes gives rise to more questions. So we go back to transforming again, visualizing it some more, modeling it again. And again, this loop that we're going through deepens our understanding of our question or our data. And then finally, we arrive at a conclusion or we fail to answer the question, but we communicate those results. And what's driving us here from left to right is a high value question. So what is a high value question? We're going to launch an analysis here and I want you to do some imaginative work here. So I'm going to ask you to have a paper and a pen ready here to just write down some thoughts. You can imagine that you're, you're getting on your way to doing a data science project here, or you're going to be working with a data science project. So you want to plan an analysis. And the first step in any analysis is to make a plan. Remember, one of those gotchas was getting lost in the, in the details, getting lost in the weeds. Having a plan will make sure that you stay on track. This plan will be our anchor as we navigate through the process of building models and summarizing results. It's very easy to get lost in the code when doing the work. We should always have a clear goal to ensure that we know what the next step is. Now there is value in doing pure exploration.
there is value in just playing with the data and trying different approaches here. But eventually, you know, we're all under deadline. We have to produce results. So we do want to have a plan and we want to stick to that code. So let's think for a moment about this high value question. How do we define the business value of a data science endeavor? What makes a given data science endeavor either high or low value? Well, does it pass a test? And our simple test here is, based on the results of my analysis, someone in my organization is able to make a better business decision. That seems like a pretty simple test, but that can be a challenging one. So now what I'd like you to do is take a moment, get your pencil and paper out here, and consider a high value question for your business or field. Chances are you already have several in mind. Does your question pass the test? So I'm gonna switch over to another slide uh, deck here in just a moment. So I'd like you to spend a few minutes of this on this. Define your area of business. Consider the data with which you are familiar and write down five questions that you believe can be answered via a data science project. You might already have those in mind. So you might be in this class right now because you have several questions, maybe more than five questions that you want answered. But see if you can take a moment here. I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes for this to write down five questions that you think can be answered via data science. Okay. Now, after you write down those five questions, number them in what you consider the simplest to the most difficult to answer. So what do you think, in your estimation, is gonna be the easiest question to answer? You already have the data, you already have some partial results, something like that, to what is the most challenging or difficult to answer? Whatever your perspective on it is, you're the one who knows your business. Then, after you do that, number those questions in order of value from the least to greatest. So what is the least valuable of those and what is the greatest value? It might be that the greatest value is the most difficult. It might be that the greatest value is the simplest. Let's just spend a moment to think about that and see here. And again, value is a judgment call here. Let me add this to the slide here. Based on the results of my analysis, someone in my organization is able to make a better decision. That's gonna be our, our test here of how good our question is. Okay. So take a couple of minutes to do that here. Take about 10 minutes to do that. Um, and in the meantime, also, if you have questions about the material that we've just covered, um, go ahead and send those in the chat window to us. I'm available for chat. JF is here as well, also answering questions. So there's two of us here. You've got a couple of experts who are ready to answer your questions. Um, but I'm going to be silent for a moment. I'm going to try to be silent here and give you a moment to think about this exercise and just jot it down on a piece of paper. Let's give it another five minutes or so. We're gonna come back to these questions. So I really do want you to write these down. If you wanna participate, if you just wanna listen, that's fine too. But if you do wanna participate, take a moment to try to write down these five questions. Given what you've understood about the first part of this lecture, what data science can do, what it is as a field, think about what are the most important questions that you have that you think can be answered with data science.
We will take a break here. We'll, we'll take a formal break at the top of the hour. So at the top of the hour, we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll move on with part two. But I do want to give you this exercise here to um, think about this. This is also a good time to ask questions about those introductory topics. I'd also like you to spend this time thinking about what parts of data science are most puzzling to you? So what do you have questions about? Is it machine learning? Is it specific vocabulary you've heard about, random forest? Do you really want to understand what that is? We're going to talk about that this afternoon. A support vector machine. Are you trying to understand what deep learning is and how it might apply to your sector? Are you mainly struggling with getting data or extracting data? What are those parts? Is it, is it just basic understanding of where you need to start off with? Think about that as well and send us those questions in the chat here. So what parts of data science are most puzzling to you? There's no wrong answer here, right? Um, there's nothing here that I'm going to say, <laughs> this is, I'm not looking at your, your questions right now. Feel free to send them if they're not sensitive. Don't send us anything sensitive, but feel free to put um, some of your questions in the chat window here. Um, but there's no wrong answer. You have questions and you know your business best. That's going to be very important. Your role here either becoming a data science or working with a data science uh, expert, part of your role is going to be providing your expertise. Sure, there's a question here about the data science process diagram. Um, so I'm going to move off this slide and go back to this diagram here. This is the understanding phase. And again, this is from a book here called R for Data Science. Uh, I can actually let me open up that link here. This is a great free book on the web. So check that out. But here is that understanding workflow. So transforming, visualize, and modeling. And I'm going to uh, borrow from Hadley Wickham. Hadley Wickham is uh, the author, one of the authors of this book in which this diagram is included. He's also an R guru. He's a developer. He's been involved in lots of R packages over the years, he contributed a lot to the R community. And he talks about um, visualizing and modeling in two ways as complementary processes. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing from him here, but I definitely encourage you to check out some of his YouTube videos. He talks about visualizing as being able to surprise us. When we visualize data, we often make discoveries in the data. We see outliers, we see trends. We see things that we didn't expect. So visualization, he says, can surprise us, but it doesn't scale well. In other words, you can only see so many dimensions on a visualization. You have so many points that you can put on it, so many different categories. It just, you can't, sometimes if you have lots and lots of big data, you can't see into it that well. You can see large trends, but maybe not smaller trends. So he says, Visualization can surprise us, but it doesn't scale well. Modeling, he says, is a complementary process that cannot surprise us because we have to make certain assumptions about the model. When we make a model, 
we restrict it, we make mathematical assumptions about it, so it's not going to surprise us, but models do scale very well. We can give them a lot of data. Great. So some of you are sending questions, and that's awesome. Um, keep those questions in mind because um, we're gonna we're gonna continue to refine them throughout the day here. Another question here is: Does a model create a black box problem? And that can be a problem for some models, especially deep learning models, artificial intelligence models. These models can sometimes, and even some other machine learning algorithms, can have a problem with explainability. If you're looking for a model that can explain relationships, does gender influence sales? Does um, region influence sale amount? How, in what direction? Do gender and region together influence how much a customer buys? Those kinds of questions can often be answered not by machine learning models, but by simpler regression models. So something that we want to think about here is explainability. <laughs> There's a question in the um, chat window to everyone too. Does COVID explain sales, for instance, of toilet paper? Or is there something else going on there? Is there some other confounding variable that's um, taking place there. These are not necessarily simple questions. So it does take quite a bit of thinking to analyze them and answer them in a definitive way. Speaking of that, I'm just uh, gonna share with you here uh, a website, a fun website that you're probably familiar with, you've probably run across as well. We'll talk about this idea of correlation. It's probably a term that you're all familiar with. Correlation is not causation, right? We all have that sort of drilled into our, our brains here. What does that mean? That means that two things can be happening together, but it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. So this is a fun website. This is called Spurious Correlations. This um, is also a book. And you can see some surprising correlations here. For instance, the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlated with the films, number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in over the years. And that might look like an alarming trend, and we would hope that Nicolas Cage would not appear in any more films to protect people from falling into pools. We just need to, we need to, we need to put a freeze on his career there. Or maybe we need to reduce cheese consumption because it correlates highly with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Now, I don't know about you. I didn't know this was a risk. I mean, I think this is a, I think this is a, a, a good way to go. You're at home, you're relaxed. I'm not sure about this, but anyway, um, clearly cheese and, uh, Bed sheet tangling are correlated, and um, you know we need to we need to reduce our cheese consumption here. No, of course that's false. This is a spurious correlation. These are two things that are happening at the same time, but it doesn't mean that one causes the other. It, this is a this can be another this is sort of a deeper gotcha here in statistical analysis. Just because you see two things that are associated that are happening seem to be correlated doesn't necessarily mean that they are, uh, that one is causing the other. Okay, we're at the um, top of the hour here. Let's take a quick break. So just a, a little, a little break here. Let's take about uh, 15 minutes and we'll come back and we'll continue working through that data science workflow. We'll talk about all the different pieces of that workflow and we'll build on the questions um, that you have developed here. Uh, but let's take a quick, 15 minute break and come back at 
do my math here and translate to East Coast time. So we are at 11 o'clock. So we'll be coming back 11.15. I hope I got that right. Um, but 15 minutes past the hour, whatever hour it is in whatever time zone you are in right now. Keep sending us questions. So as you have questions, um, uh, let me know. And I will put this website here. This is, a, again, a fun one. The spurious correlations here to go check out, read through it. It's kind of, it's good for a, um, I don't know if it's a laugh, there's some grim humor in here, but uh, you can check it out and, and see some of those traps there. So take a quick break, come back, and then we'll continue on. Thanks so much.
Hey, we haven't started yet, so we'll we'll get going here in another 10 minutes or so. We're on a break right now, so um, we'll get underway. But I'm just giving people a chance here to go grab another beverage of your choice, coffee, water, whatever it may be. Um, look away from the computer. This is all about ergonomics as well. We want to make sure we don't um, burn our eyes out staring at a computer all day long. It's a little too easy to do these days. Um, so definitely take a break here, have a stretch um, if you can, and uh, uh, come back and we'll continue on. Just another, gonna give us another eight minutes here and then we'll get underway. Hi, we're still on a break. We're going to give this another five minutes and then we'll get underway. So again, just uh, take this opportunity to uh, relax, uh, think about your questions, and we'll come back in just about five minutes and continue.
Okay, we are back. So we're going to continue on here and we're going to keep talking about this data processing phases, the sort of the, the different phases of the data science project here. Um, so we'll look at these slides. We'll go back into that Jupyter Notebook here and keep following along with that as well. That's intended just to just be a simulation here of just sort of taking you through a, a simple data science project workflow. It's a little bit abbreviated. We're not going to go through all the steps in a detailed way, but should give you a, a general sense of the flavor of what it can look like. So I want to um, answer a question here that came through on the chat during the break that I thought was a really great question which is how much stats do you need to have to be a data scientist? Well, it depends. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Um, some people do approach the data science discipline more from a computer science background, so more from a uh, computational. Um, that's where they're coming from. That's their entry into it. Or they come from business analytics um, as well. That's a very common pathway as well. And I think the question maybe isn't how much do you need to have, but how much do you want to have? Because having those, that statistical background, you're going to find pretty quickly that you're going to want to acquire those skills and acquire that understanding because it's going to give you more insights. It's going to give you more tools. You're going to understand these algorithms, the processes that we're using in a deeper way. And I know that sometimes people have had bad experience with stats. Um, you might have taken a class way back in high school <laughs> or something like that that maybe wasn't the best, um, maybe traumatized you a little bit. That's okay, but stats is actually very powerful. It's really interesting. It's one of the languages that we speak in in the world nowadays. It's hopefully how a lot of decisions are made through evidence and statistics. Um, so it's very important, I think, that we we do um, not shy away from statistics and we engage with it and acquire it as a tool if we want to call ourselves a data scientist. There is a book here that I can recommend. So this is a nice book called Practical Stats for Data Scientists. So this is um, from the O'Reilly Publishers. And this is aimed just uh, to sort of that question directly. Um, this is kind of trying to give you a rapid, quick start onto um, what are the essential things you need to know in stats um, here to be conversant in some of the vocabulary in data science, uh, in the data science discipline. Um, this book is, I believe, coming out with a new edition, second edition in June of next month. So you may not want to buy it. You may just want to go look for it at a library or, or see if you can borrow it from somebody here. It's a pretty common one out there. Um, but there is a new version coming, I believe, next month. It's still on schedule. So just a word about uh, if you're considering buying it. I have no relationship to O'Reilly here. I'm not, I, it's just a publisher that I like, but I can recommend this good, uh, book. It's a little bit opinionated in some places, um, but I think that it, it does have um, some good information in it to get you started. As we keep going through the day here, I'll also show you some other resources. There's a lot that's available online for free. Um, so there are some other good entire books available online about uh, data science and machine learning and um, uh, practicing here that are available for free. So I will definitely try to point you in that direction uh, when we arrive at that point. Okay, so let's continue on with talking about this, um, these phases of the data science project here. So uh, this is kind of like the diagram that I had before. It's the same idea here of how we go through the many phases of answering that question. So we'll do this, and then we'll go back to that Jupyter Notebook and keep working through it here um, as a sort of demo, uh, an example with some simulated data. So we have data discovery, data harvesting, data priming, model planning, model building, communicating results, and production rollout. So this is the rephrasing of that uh, diagram that I showed you before. Again, different opinions here. There's, there's different people who um, schematize this in different ways. This is another way that we can look at the process. So 
So this is, you know, before I showed you that simple diagram with the arrow going from left to right, here's a little more complex diagram that gives you some idea of the work that needs to be done to accomplish that, right? So we have um, bringing in our data on the left-hand side. So this operational data, data integration, external data, all that, these uh, three shapes on the left-hand side, this is about importing data, ingesting data. Then in the middle section here, we have that cleaning of data, which is in our other diagram referred to as the tidy phase of the data. And you can see some of the other activities um, associated with that. In this diagram, again, which is more detailed, it's also showing typical roles that are assigned to these uh, different actions. So someone who's bringing in data and cleaning data might be specifically a data engineer. In a very large project, these roles might be separated and it could be that different people are doing different portions of this uh, workflow. A data analyst might be taking some of that cleaning data, uh, might be working with it and creating summaries of the data, making reports around it, analyzing summary statistics there. In the center portion, that's what we uh, corresponds to our transformation stage in the other diagram. So looking at our features, transforming those features, getting them prepared for the model features are the, uh, we'll talk about this in more depth here, but these are the variables that we want to use in our model. These are what we think, uh, if we're doing predictive analytics, predicts our outcome. You can see that at this point, in this diagram, the data scientist is starting to get involved. Then on the right-hand side, we have the modeling portion. That involves a lot of sub-steps as well. And then at some point, we sort of have this accepted model. What's implied in this diagram is uh, additionally the communication of results and then productionalizing the model. We have some slides down below that describe that as well. So again, just another view on the process um, that involves the many stages of the data science project. If this looks complicated, it is. Uh, a lot of this can take a lot of time. It can be difficult work. So good communication between all of these people is necessary. It can also be just one data scientist who is responsible for the entire chain. Depending on the scale of the project here, it could be a single data scientist who is responsible for bringing in the data, cleaning it, et cetera. Here, um, one of the first stages is identifying the data that is important for your project, right? And this is what we started to um, go towards here as we were defining our questions, getting the good data that is appropriate for it. We want to align the discovery phase targets with our strategic business goals. So that idea, again, of the high value question. A data scientist must work crucially with the business to learn about the problem domain. A data scientist is an expert in, hopefully in all things analytical, in models and different machine learning techniques, in statistics, in how to get from A to B. Um, they should have, they probably will have, depending on how long they've worked at a business, insight into the business as well. But there will be other people in the business who have expertise in a particular domain, and you'd want to work closely with those to make sure you are phrasing the question in an actionable way. You want to identify the source and the size of the data sets here. It might be several data sets that you need to merge together in order to accomplish your analysis. And you want to plan for what kind of computing, data processing, storage needs. Is this a large problem? working across several clusters of data, what kinds of computers do you need, what are the specs, et cetera. Deep learning takes um, quite a bit of 
computational power. So it is computationally expensive. And when I say computationally expensive, I mean that it can take on the order of days or weeks to fit a model, a deep learning model. That's not uncommon. So that's something that you have to plan for. We'll come back to that idea later. The next phase here is the data harvesting phase. That's where you now retrieve the data from those sources. So you have your ETL scripts that are developed. Data might be coming from outside sources. It's going to be transformed to fit what you need for the analysis. It's going to be loaded into that target system. So if it's a Hadoop cluster or a NoSQL database in the target system, whatever it is you need to work with. If it's a, a Python analysis, so it need to be loaded into um, a database, is it going to fit into memory? If it's not going to fit into memory, is it going to fit on disk? If it's not going to fit on disk, will it fit into a cluster? All of those kinds of decisions need to be made. If you are retrieving data from external sources, um, sometimes that data will require additionally, additional cleaning, additional transformation to make it conform um, to your uh, to other data that you may have. I've run into this commonly. Again, this can be a time-consuming task. Um, perhaps one data source uh, from an external vendor can have categories coded one way. Uh, your internal categorical data is coded in a different way, and it can be quite a struggle to get the two of them to match. <laughs> but it's a fun puzzle. It's something that you work on, and eventually you figure it out. Then we go into the tidy phase. Now, there's a lot of words for this phase. Um, I, like the, I like the word tidy that was in that other slide here, but some other verbs that are associated with it, some other descriptions of it are data wrangling, data engineering, data munging. I don't particularly like the term data munging. That sounds unpleasant. That doesn't sound like something that I want to spend my time doing, munging. I don't even know what that is, but it doesn't sound fun. I like the term data wrangling. Sounds like I'm out on the range, I'm outdoors. Sounds sporty, that sounds good. I've also heard it referred to as data carpentry. So that sounds like a hobby, that sounds enjoyable and pleasant. Or uh, another one is uh, data knitting. Um, that's another choice here. But whatever it is, it's generally the process here of Uh, of, of organizing your data and cleaning it up, of wrangling it, of getting it into the shape that you need. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the steps involved in this um, here in our demo as well. So things like trimming off obvious outliers, looking at corrupt or duplicate or missing or incomplete data records, those can really sideline an analysis, and we've got an exercise for the afternoon in thinking about missing data as well. I'm talking about missing data in a more detailed way here. Additionally, in this step, data may be augmented or enhanced or transformed. So you may do things like bin data. You have a continuous variable, and you want to discretize it or categorize it. You want low, medium, and high. You might normalize your data or scale it. Um, this is something that you often need to do as a pre-processing step for machine learning. You might have values on vastly different scales. Um, right? You might have a, a binary variable in your data set. So it just has a value of yes or no, zero or one. And alongside that, you might have a variable that's in the thousands or in the millions. For some machine learning algorithms to work efficiently, uh, to give you good results, you need to normalize those to a common scale. Features are engineered, so sometimes you have a date variable or you have several different variables and you need to transform them into something else in order to put day of the week, for example, to put into your data set or seasonality, something like that. A question here about how you make sure that you have 
you can undo your data priming and go back to the original pristine data. You must always have a source of your original data. You must always keep a copy of your original data. Don't ever work on the original data. Always copy it. That is incumbent on you, the analyst here, to make sure that, uh, that there is an original copy that you can go back to. It's very easy, it's very common to make mistakes as you're going along. We do this all the time, I do this all the time. Even just trying to parse a date, uh, if you write the code wrong or you've supplied a bad format, you can have missing values uh, populate in your data. You wanna make sure that you can undo that. So always work on a copy of your data. That's one of the first stages of our process here. The next big phase of our process is what's called EDA or exploratory data analysis. Now this was a field, um, it may seem, this may seem obvious to you, this may be something that you already do and you're well familiar with, but this was actually invented as it were by a statistician um, in the middle of the last century called Tukey. He's the one who pioneered this, wrote a book around this, and this was a systematic approach to understanding data. So EDA methods here, exploratory data analysis, and we'll, we'll run through some examples of this, are visualization techniques and quantitative summary statistics as well. We usually perform this before uh, we do any uh, models, before we do any statistical models or machine learning models. Because at this stage, we want to understand that we understand, uh, we want to uncover or make discoveries in those relationships. We want to under, uh, seek an understanding of the basic relationships between the variables uh, in our data set. The best models come from the best understanding of our data. Again, a, a fallacy here is that you're going to have a bunch of data, you're going to put it into a fancy algorithm, a machine learning algorithm, and it's going to spit out surprising results for you, and you will win the day. That doesn't happen. You get your best results by understanding and having expertise in your data. And sometimes a simpler technique can give you better results. When you're doing EDA, you might reduce your big data to just a very representative subsample. And here you're going to do things like determining important variables, features. This will also help with what we call dimensionality reduction in your models. As we mentioned before, you can have very big data sets here with lots of features. It's not uncommon for data sets these days to have hundreds or thousands of features. In other words, potential variables that might go into a, an algorithm or a model. The more variables we have, the more features we have, the potentially longer computational time that's going to take to fit, to train and fit and predict on that model. So if we can reduce that feature space, if we can reduce the dimension of that problem, we can get uh, better metrics, better CPU utilization, uh, faster convergence, all that kind of good stuff. Just answering a question here, one moment. Okay, then our next phase here is the model planning phase. So we're gonna select the appropriate model here or several candidates of model that fit the data and the project objectives. You might even do this earlier in the data analytics life cycle. You might have a, an idea from the beginning of what kind of model you're gonna fit. Now, in statistics, we have quite a rigorous 
um, way that we set up what are called uh, hypothesis testing. So um, we decide on a model up front and gather the data under what we call the null hypothesis. So that's, that'll go a little bit deeper into the stats there, but we do um, often pre-specify a model when we start to think about our project. Um, an important activity here is to ensure that the features are independent, um, that there's no correlation between the variables. This can cause problems in our um, bias in our results. Um, it can cause uh, some, uh, what correlation does when uh, variables are correlated is it, it masks information of one variable to another. It can be a spurious relationship as we've seen. We can also generate new variables here based on existing ones. Again, this is called that transformation step. Often here, what we do is perform a quick proof of concept on a data sample. So um, again, because when we're working with large data, these problems can be computationally expensive and they can take a long time. We can subsample our data and make sure that the code is running first and everything's good before we go ahead and launch the full model. A question here about graphic software and um, spreadsheets helping with exploratory data analysis. Yes, um, the Tableau program, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is a focus on that exploratory data uh, analysis. And that's one of the aspects of it. So that can be, uh, it's a very popular solution here for uh, analyzing data in an exploratory way. However, you can do all of this as well with tools like Python and R um, and some others also. And it's really up to you how you want to approach any uh, solving any of these problems. So some people prefer to stay exclusively within, let's say, the Python ecosystem to do all of these stages of the process. So I want to bring my data into Python. I'm going to um, clean it up using Python. I'm going to do my exploratory data analysis using Python um, and all the way through the modeling and writing up the Jupyter Notebook report. Some people say, you know, I really like Tableau, for example, and so I'm going to export the data and go do some of this visual stuff in Tableau. That's up to you. Um, that's really up to you and how you can best optimize your workflow. And of course, that also depends on uh, what tools you do have access to. The next phase here of the process is building the model. So here, and we'll talk about this in a more detailed way this afternoon. So this will be uh, quite a bit of the focus of the afternoon session is uh, looking at some demonstrations of how we split data up into training and test data sets for machine learning. We often make several models along the way and we compare those models and so we assess model metrics here. We try to understand how computationally expensive these models are, what resources, what kind of memory and disk space the models will require, and we try to, to establish those um, capacities so that we don't start training a model and run out of memory three days into the model. Another question here in the chat is, how many data models are there out there and are there templates for these models? Um, the answer to the first part of that question is a lot. There's lots of different kinds of models, lots of different kinds of algorithms that you can apply to your data. However, only certain ones are appropriate to the problems that you're asking. So not all models are applicable to every problem. That's why you need to understand your data and have some domain knowledge here to understand what is the appropriate model to apply to your data problem. 
In terms of templates for the models, yes, we do have a systematic way of, of thinking through what we want to put into those models. Again, there's certain appropriate um, inputs for models and in particular appropriate outputs for models. And we'll talk about this, I think, as we start to go into the afternoon and talk about different algorithms here, some of this will become a little bit clearer about some of these domains and the models. We'll, we'll, we'll see some graphics here. We'll look at different ways that um, people organize the domain of uh, available models here. But there's a lot out there. There's, there's more all the time here as people keep developing techniques. I understand that that can be intimidating at first. It can seem confusing. That is one of the real hurdles here when you're learning about data science and you're thinking about modeling is just understanding um, where you start and what you should use. I'll show you a resource here that is, um, uh, when we get to that part of it, that sort of the pathway through um, uh, shows you, uh, prompts you in, in one uh, expert's opinion, of where you should start depending on the problem that you have at hand. Okay, so you've done all this work, um, then you want to communicate the results. So you write some kind of report that has visualizations, diagrams, um, tables, that summarizes the problem, summarizes your methodology, discusses any further questions that were arise uh, that arose during the analysis and that maybe suggest actions to be taken. Now that communication again, this is a um, very important part of the workflow here. Um, you may be presenting or the data scientists may be presenting those to different kinds of audiences. Maybe it's going to be to non technical people, um, people who are interested in the business. So you have to think about how your complicated analysis, your modeling and all this work you're, you've done, how does it simplify down to an action that they can take that is relevant and understandable to them? You want, kind of always want to have that end goal in mind here as you're working through the project, right? Eventually it's going to go to somebody. They may not be a technical person. How are they going to understand it? It really helps if you keep that question in mind as you're going through the entire thing and keep returning to it and checking in with them as well. Visualizations are an important part of that. There are good visualizations and bad visualizations, and we can talk about that in the afternoon. I'll show you some resources there. Um, I'll just recommend one book here, which if you don't know about it, is a fantastic read. This is a classic in the field. Um, this is an author called uh, Edward Tufte, and this book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, is a really great book. It's a beautiful book as well um, that talks about how we visualize data or how we present it. This is a, was a very influential book across uh, visualization um, data analytics. It's influenced, you may not realize it, but it's influenced a lot of the software that you're using in terms of the minimal um, look and feel to visuals. So things like Tableau, R, and Python were all influenced by this book. He has several books. I recommend starting with this one here and reading through it again. It's a very enjoyable read. You learn a lot. Um, it's really thinking about what's the important information on the page? What's the story that you're telling? What is the noise that you can take away? So a highly recommended book there um, in terms of data visualization. You can find it in the library too. It's a very common book. It's not something you need to buy, but you can generally a colleague will have it. Uh, someone will have it on their bookshelf or you can find it in the library as well. Okay, so you've done all this work. Um, you've communicated it. You've got a good uh, product then one of the last phases may be a production rollout. So how do you take this model and deploy it, productionalize it? Um, so that may be incorporating the data science model that you've built into a piece of software. Maybe that software takes inputs from users and makes predictions, for instance, like a recommender engine. 
Now, one thing about uh, predictive models here is that they degrade over time. So part of that production rollout is also monitoring that model to make sure it's using the resources um, that you need. Um, but you'll see that models change over time. As we get new data and put new data into them, models can degrade. Um, because again, a model is only based on past information that it's seen. So models then need to be, and products like this, then need to be retuned periodically. Sometimes that means putting new data into the model, running a new model. Sometimes that means completely changing the approach and going back to the beginning again. This is a whole, this is a whole other part of the field as well. For instance, think about for a moment, if you have a model that classifies cars. And in your car database that the models looked at, it has trucks and minivans and hatchbacks. So a small car, a minivan, and a pickup truck. Those are the three, three kinds of cars that your database has. And you've trained your model to identify cars as being one of those three types. Well, what happens now if this year a new class of car comes on the market, let's say a Cybertruck. So a Cybertruck emerges and your model has never seen this before. What is your model going to do with this information? Well, depending on the model that you've written, it's going to try to classify this object as a pickup truck or a minivan or a hatchback because that's all it knows about. Another gotcha here with machine learning models is they can't necessarily define emerging trends. If they haven't seen it, if it's not in the past data, they're not going to be aware of it and they won't be able to correctly identify it. Okay, so we talked about these main data processing phases, data discovery, data harvesting, data priming, model planning, model building, communicating the results, and production rollout. Let's go jump back to that um, Jupyter notebook here and just walk through a couple of these phases with a simulated data set. So we're going to do this for a little bit more time. We're going to work on our question here again. We're going to come back to that. So here's our data science workflow diagram. This is just a simplified version. It's equivalent to what we just talked through, just a little bit simplified with fewer stages. But you can see that we can expand this, um, narrow it down, and that there's, you know, in this simplified version, there are, of course, several sub-steps in this to accomplish um, this uh, diagram. Okay, so a little bit earlier, you thought about a question. Um, that question hopefully is a statement of a testable research question. We're using data science here to attempt to answer that question. These are the, as a, as a scientist, data scientist, this is what you need to ask yourself. How will I know when it's answered? What results will tell me what the answer actually is? We have to take that question and translate it into a clearly stated statistical or mathematical term so that we can know if we've answered that question or not. So we have to take what is abstract to us and translate it into actual quantities that we can measure, statistics that we can test, models that we can fit. You have a question Inherent in that question is some kind of quantitative construct. 
I'm sure that whatever question you thought about and wrote down, there's some way to measure the success of that question. In order to answer that question, we are almost certainly trying to make inference on some unknown quantity based on observed data. And this is a little bit of statistical talk here, this idea of inference or inferential stats here. In other words, probably we're looking at past data, but we wanna make a statement about unseen data or future data, and that's called making inference. So in order to do that, we have to narrow it down to what we call a parameter of interest or a statistic of interest. And that will let us know how we can then make that inference. This goes back to that idea of how do we know what model to fit or how do we know what technique to uh, use to approach this? The first step in that is figuring out what it is that we're trying to measure. What is that statistic? Now, part of that is, as we mentioned, that first stage, identifying the data that we need to make that inference. Do we have the appropriate data? Do we need more or different data? Our data may be limited. Maybe we don't have the right data. There are always limitations. If we could easily calculate the answer, we wouldn't need statistics. If you're just answering a question about the past, you want to know historically what all your customers have spent in a given month in January over the entire history of the company. Maybe you have that and you can answer that question definitively. But often we're not trying to do that. We're trying to take that past data and answer some other question, use that information and answer something else. Maybe we don't have fully complete past data. Maybe there's some gaps in our data. Um, that's a, a common case. So often we have limitations and we need to work around those limitations. We'll come back to this exercise at the end here. So we'll come back to that one. So here I'm going to show you again a simplified version of some of these stages in a data science workflow. And we're going to do part of this this morning, um, and then we're going to come back to some of the more detailed models this afternoon. So we'll see how far we get in this demonstration right now, and then we'll come back to um, continue on this in the afternoon. As we mentioned, the first phase of the data science project is to bring the data into whatever toolkit we're using. In this example, in this Jupyter notebook, we're using Python. Don't worry too much about the individual vocabulary that we're using here. Um, we're going to be using these uh, packages that we mentioned before, Pandas, Seaborn, and something else called stats models here. But you don't have to do it here. You have a variety of toolkits that you can use to solve this, SAS, R, um, Spark, lots of other toolkits. The general approach is going to be the same here. Let's say our data arrives to us as a CSV, a comma separated values file. This is a text file format that is commonly used to share data between lots of different kinds of programs and tools like Excel, Python, and SAS. So again, here's that reminder. Always preserve your source data in its original format. Don't ever change your source data. Always make sure you have some copy of that source data to go back to. Now, many database architectures take care of this for you. You're going to be pulling off a copy of the data. When you're bringing it into Python here, you're reading it from a CSV file and you're creating an object in memory. So that's taken care of for you, but you don't want to rewrite over that CSV file. You want to make sure that you have that. Take it, put it aside, put it in a locker, keep it safe. It's easy to make mistakes. We all make mistakes all the time. Okay, here's a, again, a simple scenario. We're getting our data as a CSV, what we call a flat file, a text file. A CSV, a comma separated values file, is not an Excel format. Even though on your computer it may show up as an Excel file, it is not an Excel format. It is a general format used for transforming data between different kinds of programs. So the first thing you ever want to do if you get a CSV is you want to open it up inside of a text editor. 
Do not use Excel to open a CSV. Use an actual text editor. So we have some simulated data here. This is our customer sales CSV, and I'm going to go to my desktop here and open it up in a text editor. So here's my desktop. Here's my data. Here's my text CSV file, and I'm just going to open it up. I'm on a Mac here with a text editor, and there's various kinds of fancy and simple text editors that you can get, um, but here's an example of one. Why is this so important? I can uh, make this bigger here. This gives us our view of our data in its rawest form, in its most raw form. Here we can see, is it really commas between the values? What is the quotation scheme of the strings? What do the numbers look like? Does it look like there's headers or variable names at the top of the file? About how many measures do, do there look to be? How many variables are there in the file? If it's a small enough file, we can scan down um, and we can see about how many. This particular text editor doesn't provide me line numbers, but I can open this in another one that does. Um, I can see about how many rows I should expect uh, when I import the data in. Again, this is an easy step to overlook, but it's a really crucial step here to make sure that you have integrity in your data. Excel will parse CSV files for you when you import them. So when you bring a CSV file into Excel, it's already made some data interpretation decisions for you. Be careful about that. That happens uncommonly, but it does happen. Okay, so we've looked at our file. We're going to bring it into Python now, into a pandas data frame here. And the next thing that we do after we import data is we check the data for its integrity. We're going to hand wave over a lot of the process here. So we won't do all the normal checks that we do. This is an abbreviated demo here, so we're not going to go through every single stage of checking the integrity of the data. There's several that we want to do here, but this will just give you a sense of the flavor of the process. This is simulated data of a fictional company. This is probably pretty typical of some kind of data that you've seen somewhere along the way. What kinds of questions might we ask of this data? So I'll pause for a minute and just let you look at this. I know you're not seeing a lot of data here on the screen. You're just seeing a few rows, a few different variables. But still, with this information, you should be able to, should prompt you to think about certain questions that you can ask of this data. So I'll just give you a minute to think about that. Marketing exposure here is a count variable. So it's how many times, we can think of it as how many times a customer has seen an advertisement. Some good questions here in the chat. What's the correlation between age and gender and sale amount? We're going to investigate some of these questions. So further down, we're going to show, we're going to, we're going to go through some of those and we're going to answer some of those questions here. Some great questions here. Are those the only values for jail, gender and sale, et cetera? We're just looking at a preview of the data. The head here is just the first five rows. We can get summary statistics of the data here. So if I call describe on this data set, I can now get an overview of some of the relevant summary statistics of this data as well. So maybe that'll inform you here also. Uh, 
This is just a thought experiment. So here, it's just for you to think about what are the kinds of questions you could ask for this data. There's more variables out to the right-hand side here. So there's things like number of accounts and income of our customers here. But again, this is simulated data. These X variables are just abstract. So think of them as some kind of measure that we've recorded, but we don't know exactly what those are. We'll just treat those as abstract. Obviously, if this was a real data set, we would want to understand those, understand what those represent. But for the moment, we'll just treat them as abstract variables. You'll notice here that what I just did is in answer to a chat, I created a new cell. And then I typed in a little bit of Python code and I got the answer for that. So this describe function here. That really demonstrates part of the power and again, the workflow of Jupyter Notebooks and Python in particular. As a data scientist, we tend to work interactively quite a bit. We have a question just like you posed of me. I go in, I write a little bit of code. I try to get the answer to that question. I take that code, I modify it. I try to get um, another answer. So maybe I want to know a little bit deeper here. Uh, maybe I don't want to describe the whole thing. Maybe I just want a sale amount description. I just want to simplify this and look at just the sale amount column. I can take that code, I can modify it, I can create another code cell, but this back and forth, um, this interactive way of working with the data is very natural to data science. It's very typical of the workflow that we do and it's different than other coding practices. So if you think about people who are coding applications up, web apps, something like that, it's a different kind of interacting with code. This is one of the reasons that R and Python are very um, popular, is that they allow this kind of back and forth, looking up an answer um, and getting results immediately like this. Okay, so after we verify the integrity of the data, the next phase of the process is to wrangle or tidy the data. So this involves checking the ranges of the measures, looking for missing values, checking data types. One of the things that we want to take care of at this phase in the process is encoding the data into a format consistent with what we call the philosophy of the data. And you're wondering, like, does a data scientist really do this? Yes, data scientists really do this. This is part of our workload. This may be someone else in the pipeline who does this but it is something we need to verify. In the end, we're gonna be doing the analysis, we're gonna be putting it in the model. So it's something we at least need to check, but it may be something that we need to address as well. What do we mean by encoding the data in a format consistent with its philosophy? Well, if a variable represents a categorical quantity, we wanna encode the variable as a categorical. If a variable represents a yes, no value, we want to make sure it is encoded with just two values. Maybe the strings yes or no, or numeric values zero or one. If it's a date time variable, we want to make sure it's properly encoded as a date time value with reasonable ranges. Data is always messy. This can be surprising to new analysts. It can be surprising to people who don't regularly work with data, but it proves true in practice. I don't care how, how many times someone tells you they're giving you a good data set, there's gonna be problems with it. And it's incumbent on you, the scientist or the analyst here, to verify that, to check the integrity and to make sure that it is good data. Data cleaning is a lengthy process. Some experts estimate it takes up to 70 to 80% of the time on a project. That can also be surprising to people, but that proves true in practice. You may not believe me now, but it's absolutely true that we spend that much time working on cleaning and preparing data. Modeling, apart from the computational time with modeling, modeling is actually a pretty short process here. It's the data preparation, it's the data wrangling and um, tidying that really takes up the bulk of the work. Okay, so in this demo, let's focus on sale amount. A high value question here, or a set of questions, sort of vaguely defined might be, what leads to sales? What influences sales? 
In this data set, we have information on sale amount, and then we have some information on our customers. So what kinds of questions can we craft from these? And you've already specified a couple of them in the chat window. So great job there. Before we do any analysis, let's check our data types. Without getting into the specifics here of the possible data types in Python, and these are like formats in um, certain statistical packages here, we'll see how our import command guessed the data types for the data at hand. So we read that from a CSV file. We just gave it a read command, said bring it into memory, put it into this data frame object, like a spreadsheet in memory. And this is what the pandas package guessed those data types were. So it looked through all the values and it parsed them and it assigned them to these data types. The object data type here is what pandas calls a string or character variable. Are all of these data types appropriate? Well, customer ID was currently brought in as an integer data type. So a numerical data type. Should an ID variable be a numeric data type? Does it make sense to have an average ID, a mean ID, or a standard deviation of ID? Probably not. Should an ID variable, okay, so if it's not numerical, then what should it be classified as? Should it be classified as a categorical variable? Well, with an ID variable, we probably have a lot of unique variable, uh, unique values, right? That's the whole point of an ID variable is that it uniquely identifies all of our different customers. So we probably don't want to encode it as a categorical variable either. A categorical variable makes sense for a variable that has 15 or 20 unique levels or less. Think about how many colors you can put on a graph, uh, about how many dimensions makes sense for that. Something like uh, an address or a full name, that's not a categorical variable. Something like uh, risk categories, high, low, medium, or um, drink sizes, you know, venti, I'm never gonna get these right. Venti, grande, I don't know what order they're in. Tall, no, I see I got those wrong. You probably know better than me, but you know, you, you're in, you know what I'm talking about. Small, medium, and large, that's a categorical variable. Let's just leave it at that. Okay, so for customer ID, we'll turn this into a string object format. And in Python, we do that with a little bit of code here that just changes the data type. And we can look afterwards and confirm, did we do what we thought we wanted? Yes, our customer ID is now a character object type. Now, in a real project, we do a lot more data wrangling. We check the data type of every variable. We probably have a lot more variables. We'd assess the amount of missing data for each variable. And in the data set as a whole, we would check the ranges of the variables. We would address categorical variables and daytime variables. For, for brevity, I know it's a little too late for that, but for brevity here, we're just gonna assume that we've done that and the data is relatively clean, okay? So here, the next phase of the process is exploratory data analysis. In this stage of the process, we want to understand our data. And there's a whole methodology for this. Again, we're gonna present a very abbreviated version of it here. For exploratory data analysis, we wanna look at one measure at a time, so a univariate exploration. And we wanna understand that variable in relation to other measures, so bivariate or multivariate exploration. And we'll use a mix of numerical analyses and visualizations here, as we mentioned in the slides. Here, we're formulating questions around sale amount. So we wanna know some basic characteristics of sale amount. What's the spread of sale amount? What's the average value of sale amount? These may seem like simple concepts, but we can measure centrality. We can measure the middle in many different ways. We can measure spread or variance also with different statistics. Which measure is best? It depends. It depends on your data and on the question that you're trying to answer.
So here again are our summary statistics for sale amount. This table gives us measures of what we call central tendency, so the middle. We get the mean here, the average sale amount, and we get the median, the 50% quantile. So those give us an idea of the middle. The mean here is not equal to the median, so that tells us something about our data. This table also gives us a measure of the spread of the data. So the standard deviation, the min and the max, and the quantiles here, the quartiles, give us some idea of the spread of the data as well. Additionally, the count here is the count of non-null values. So this tells us how much missing data we have or not. So this is one key component of statistical summaries. The other is looking at the data. We have a vaguely formulated question of what leads to sales. What do we mean by that? If we hope to answer the question, we have to be more specific about our measures. Are we interested in the biggest sale? Are we more interested in whether a sale happens or not? So a zero sale or some positive sale? Are we interested in the average sale amount? It's crucial that we always examine our variables, especially variables that we're interested in, both numerically and visually. With a histogram or a distribution plot, we can see the distribution of sale amount. We can see what the shape of it looks like. So look at this uh, data down below. I'll show it here in a minute. And think about these questions. Is it normally distributed? Normally here is not the, doesn't mean, um, it's not the opposite of weird. Normal here is a statistical term, meaning the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution. It's that bell curve distribution that you're familiar with. Many measures have this kind of shape to them. Or is the data skewed, which means it's leaning to one side. Is it symmetrical? Does it have more than one peak in it? Is it noisy? Does it have some weird shape? These all tell you something about um, the data. These prompt decisions, for someone who's a trained data scientist, these will prompt decisions and assessments about what hypotheses we can make, what questions we can ask, and what our models might look like. So here's our distribution plot of sale amount. What do you think of that one? Does that look symmetrical to you? If you know what a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, does that look like a bell curve to you? Skewed, painfully skewed, I like these answers. That's great. Yeah, there's something really weird going on here. Well, it's not weird actually. This is pretty typical with cost or financial data. We have a very large point mass at zero. So in this particular data set, um, let's say this represents average sales, or this represents a, a sale, a sum of sales per a period of time, let's say a year. So we have some customers in which we made zero sales during this period of time. So we've got a lot of zero sales, and then we have some other sales that are not zero. Now, you can analyze this kind of data. This is a more complicated situation, but there are models, things like hinge and hurdle models that you can run on this data as is. But we're gonna simplify the problem here, again, for the purpose of brevity and demonstration. We're gonna transform sale amount, so we just look at the positive sale amounts. So a little bit of Python code, we're gonna create a subset of our data, just looking at the records where sale amount is greater than zero. And once we eliminate all those zeros, this is what our sale amount looks like. So this is what we're actually going to analyze down the road, probably this afternoon here. Now it's looking not so funky as it was before, but it's still skewed, right? We've got a lot of lower uh, amounts there, smaller amounts between zero and 500. We have some sale amounts here up at the upper end of the spectrum, but not as many. So that's what we call a skewed distribution. It's leaning to one side here. And that's pretty typical in financial or cost 
data. So with SKEWED here, what questions can we ask now? Well, let's focus on average sale amount. That might lead us to questions like, what traits in our customer lead to higher average sales? So our question has narrowed a little bit. It's changed subtly here, but importantly, we're focusing on a measurable summary statistic, the mean. When we say the average, we're talking about the mean. And you know, if, you're, if you've done a little bit of stats here, you know that we use the mean a lot. There's mathematical reasons for that. The mean is mathematically tractable. Um, it's nice to use in a lot of situations. Um, so we're going to choose that for our subsequent analysis down below. Now, it's not the only choice we have to make here. We could analyze the median. We could analyze quantiles of our data. So we could look at the 90th quantile of sales here. We could see what leads to higher sales. There are techniques for that, things like quantile regression. There are lots of choices. But again, going back to that idea of how do you know what approach or what model you're going to use? It's when you make decisions at this point. If you say, I'm going to focus on the mean here, then that's going to uh, restrict the kinds of models and the kinds of uh, techniques that we're going to use to answer that question. OK, we're going to come back to this after lunch, but I want to go back to this um, next exercise here. So. Uh, you had started defining some questions. Uh, we want to, um, I want you to go back to those questions here. Oops, sorry about that. Um, uh, I have some questions on the chat and I'll answer them in just a second here, but this is what I want to leave you with here before the break. So just take a few minutes and um, we're going to take a break here at 1230 um, uh, East Coast time. So we're going to take our long break here in the middle of the day, but I want you to take the questions that you wrote down before and refine them. So think about um, this, these questions and think about why the question matters, and what am I making inference on? What is that parameter or construct? So if you had a question of how is this going to influence, um, you know, uh, my results, what are you actually measuring there? Are you measuring a specific variable or set of variables? It doesn't have to be one thing here. It could be more than one thing. Are you measuring the average performance, the median performance, the minimum, the maximum? What is it? Try to refine your data in terms of what we just talked about to an actual measurable parameter or construct. Now, you may not have the vocabulary yet to know what's possible here, um, but you know, I think you probably have the understanding of averages and minimums and maximums and things like that. So those are all, uh, we can look at variances, standard deviations, things like that, but try to refine your question down now to an actual parameter that you're interested in that is what you would create a model out of. Hi, we are back and we're going to get underway again. Um, uh, a couple of questions as we get uh, underway here. Um, we'll continue on with the materials. Um, so we're going to we're going to dive back into this demonstration here and just go through a couple more scenarios, and then we'll go back to that um, those course notes and and talk in more depth about machine learning, different algorithms, uh, what is a model, all that good stuff. Uh, here, a question in, a, uh, in the chat is if you can uh, use a geometric mean instead of normalizing. Um, yes, you can absolutely use a geometric mean. That can be your statistic of interest. So that's going to be different techniques, different kinds of regression or modeling that you're going to do with that. So yeah, whatever it is that you, you pick there, there are techniques associated along with it. Normalizing is a particular technique that we use for certain machine learning algorithms. So again, certain algorithms, especially um, uh, penalized regression algorithms, things like ridge regression, lasso, elastic net, they're going to prefer to work on, or they're going to make more sense working on normalized or standardized data. 
also certain clustering algorithms will, um, because they have this idea of distance in it, will make more sense with normalized or standardized data. But yes, there are, there are a number of different approaches here always that you can use to get your answer. So I know that was maybe a little bit of a general uh, answer there, but hopefully that um, uh, got to the heart of your question. Okay, so we left off here. Um, we were talking about this average sale amount. We decided to focus down on that, the, uh, the mean here. And again, one reason is that in this case, the, the mean, as you'll, when you start to study statistics here, um, there's many nice things, nice properties of the mean in terms of the calculations we can do here. There's also laws like the central limit theorem um, that uh, empower some of the kinds of models that we want to do here. But in a simple way, we've chosen the mean here and we're going to move forward with that. So maybe we want to, um, as part of our exploratory analysis here, describe this statistic in relation to other variables in our data. So maybe, as some of you um, prompted in the questions there, maybe we're interested in average sale amount relative to, say, a trait of our customers like sex. We can examine that bivariate relationship here, the relationship between a continuous measure, sale amount, and a categorical or nominal measure, sex or gender here. In this example, sex is a binary variable that either has male or female. We can calculate the average sale amount. We got that from our summary statistics up above, or we can recalculate it here. So this is another way that we can calculate the average sales. This is just the positive sales. Remember that we've subset our data down here. So this is just of the sales that occurred, this is the mean of the positive sales. So that's one thing to keep in mind here if this were a formal analysis that we were doing. And we then might want to examine um, the frequency counts of our categorical data. So when we're looking at categorical data, the way we summarize that categorical data is by a frequency count or by a proportion. We can then examine our statistic across these categories. So again, in this case, we have two categories and we're gonna look at this average sale amount across these two categories. And the technique we use for that is something called a group by analysis or split, apply, combine. That's just a fancy way of saying, split our data up into categories apply an aggregating statistic like the mean here and combine the results in a table to compare them. And our question is, are average sales the same between these two categories or is it different? It's a simple question, but it's a powerful question. Is it the same or the different? Is the average sale amount equal for men and women in our data or does it differ? And we can see from the numbers below that it differs by quite a bit. So that's our numerical summary of it. Our visualization here, the appropriate plot for a continuous and categorical relationship is a box plot. The box plot lets us compare distributions across a category. It could be multiple levels of a category. In this case, again, it's just two. And we're asking the same question here. Are these distributions, are the characteristics of the data here the same or different across these two categories? Are the middles the same? Are the distributions both symmetric when we split it up by this category? Are the ranges, the whiskers here on the box plot the same? Are there potential outliers? So this is the Seaborn library that's giving us this plot here. Again, this is a Python package that generates this for us. We're doing it in the context of a Jupyter notebook here. I'm not trying to focus on the um, Python syntax. You can learn that in a different course here. We're just trying to look at the graphic and understand how it informs our question here. Here's our box plot. Is it the same or different? These look pretty different. The middle line represents the median. These don't line up. The boxes represent the middle 50% of the data. They don't line up either. The data is still skewed. We can see that the box doesn't fall in the middle of the whiskers here. So this is still skewed data for both of them, although of a different shape for women than men. And we have outliers in both groups, potential outliers, depending on how you draw the map of the box plot. 
So the box plot's a comparison tool here, and it also reinforces that idea that there's something different happening. There's a different response, different average sale amount between men and women. So we'll accelerate a little bit now into modeling this. Our question is, does average sale amount differ by gender or stated differently, does gender predict average sale amount? Now we can do this with something called a linear regression. This is probably a technique that you learned uh, sometime in high school or in college, a math technique. It's a pretty straightforward technique. Um, I'll show you a graphic here from, uh, this is a book on forecasting. This is in R, um, but this has a nice graphic of R linear model. So this is probably something you're familiar with at some point along the way, you've encountered this line of best fit. So we have our scatter plot. We've got some predictor on the X axis. We have our outcome on the Y axis. In our case, our outcome Y is average sale amount and our predictor just has two values, male or female. But let's say it was a continuous predictor like this one. We have a scatter plot and then we have some line that fits that scatter plot best. How do we know what is the best fitting line? Well, there's different ways we can measure that. One way we can measure that is to minimize squared error. Might be a term that you've heard about. An error here is the idea of the difference between our model, the straight line, and the actual data points. So here's the actual data points, this green arrow is the error or also termed the residual. And there's a formula that describes this line. This formula is that good old formula you learned in, in algebra again, or geometry, or, or some point along the way, mx plus b, an intercept and a slope to the line, right? In stats, we stated a little bit more formally as beta zero, that's our intercept, Beta one is our slope, E is our error term. So we're saying this is our, our model. This is a linear model here, a straight line that fits this best by minimizing the difference between the actual data points and our model here. We can fit an even simpler model than this. So a, a simpler kind of most basic model that we can fit in terms of linear regression is something called the null model, where we take away this middle term beta one times X, we take away the slope term. That's a really, really simple model. Um, but it is a model called the null model. And so it just looks like this. The average sale amount is equal to some number plus some error around the number. Okay, that doesn't seem like a very good model. I mean, we're just predicting the intercept here or we're predicting the average sale amount um, with, uh, and this error is understood to be mathematically normally distributed parameter with a mean of zero and a variance of some sigma squared. I'll kind of hand wave over that for now. Seems like a pretty simple model, but it is a model and it's what we call a naive model. If I gave you no other information and I said, uh, and you asked me, what's your prediction for next year's average sales? My answer might be if I had no other parameters, well, what, was, what were the average sales of this year? That's my prediction for next year. So that's what we call the naive model or the null model. And we can fit this in Python. So this is using a library called stats models to do this. Um, and we're just predicting the average sale amount by the intercept here. This is a special notation. I'm going to hand wave over it. I won't go into what it's doing there. But this shows you a very, very simple model and what that model output looks like in Python. And the main number we want to focus on here is our intercept term. That's 418. That's exactly what we got with the observed uh, mean of the sale amount. 
Okay, so it doesn't seem, again, that informative, hasn't done too much for us here, but the null model gives us a baseline. As we start to create other models, we can compare it to this very simple one and say, are we doing better than this? So let's consider this other model now, this model with a single predictor, which is going to be gender, this binary variable as a first use case here. Again, as a reminder, we've done our summary statistics. We've looked at average sales for men versus average sales for women. The numbers look different. All of these other metrics here are metrics about the fit of the model. So down at the bottom here are uh, measures of what we call uh, model goodness of fit. So things like skewness and kurtosis are measures of the residuals, those error terms. These help us describe whether this is a good fitting model or not, or whether we need to make a better fitting model. Um, this is what stats models reports. So some of these others, Tobin Watson, Jarkibera, again, are on the normality of the residuals um, and the uh, correlation of the residuals as well. Right now, we have such a simple model. We just have an intercept only. It's not a very good model. We have an R squared, which is like that correlation. It's telling us how much variability was captured in the model and it's zero right now. R squared, generally, in a simplified way, we can say ranges between zero and one. One would be a perfectly fitting model. We're nowhere near that. But again, this is because we just have an intercept only model. So let's add in a term here. Let's add in gender. Again, we can look at the numbers as we split them apart. Another way that we can compare them is by doing a a density plot or a histogram for the two groups. So this is for males and females. We're comparing the distributions here. Do these two hills line up? Do they stack one on top of the other? No, they don't here. Again, telling us that it looks like different distributions between the two groups. So this is the very simple model that we're gonna fit. Average sale amount is equal to an intercept term plus some indicator variable for gender, plus some error. Here is our outcome sale amount. Here is our one predictor, which is gender. Now this notation is taking care of some other things behind the scenes here. Gender is a character or string variable But under the hood here, this, this uh, method that we're fitting, this package that we're fitting, is turning that gender variable into what we call dummy encoding. And we'll talk about that in the slides coming up here. It's turning that string variable into a numerical variable that either has a value zero or one. So one category uh, is gonna be coded as zeros. The other category is going to be coded as one. And we're not controlling which one is which here. We're letting the program figure it out, but we'll see what decision it's made because we're gonna see what is the reference category in our resulting model. Okay, we're, again, we're hand waving over a lot of this output here, but we'll point out that our R squared, in other words, how variability we're capturing in our model or a rough measure of how good a model we're fitting has gone up. So it's better than zero. And here are the coefficients or the terms that our model has fit uh, for this very simple model. 580 for the intercept. Uh, it's
it will resolve here. Um, I'll try to keep talking through this. I apologize for that. Uh, let me see if I can move location here and find a better location that has a stronger signal. I'll be uh, just one second here. Hey all, I've moved to a different location. Hopefully the signal will be um, uh, more stable here. Um, I wasn't far from where I started off this morning, but hopefully this will work. And uh, let me know if the audio issues continue. I apologize for that. Here's our uh, model equation. Now with our parameter estimates substituted back into the model. So here's our intercept term and our gender term. So what this is telling us is average sale amount, according to this model, we would predict it as 580.9 minus 285.4 if the customer is male, this becomes a one. We subtract this number from our intercept. If the customer is a female, this term is zero and it goes away and we just have 580.9. Now that's pretty much what we got from our summary statistics there, but this model tells us some other things here. It tells us if that intercept term is statistically significantly related to the outcome. So in addition to that number, the model gives us the result of the statistical test as well. And that's an important component of answering this question. This is an inferential statistical test here. This is telling us the numbers seem different, they look different, but are they statistically significantly different based on the data that we have? Do we think these results are unusual enough that we would say this is a true difference? This is what we call a p-value here, and that's the realm of inferential statistics and hypothesis testing. So there's a couple of extra important components that the model gives us beyond just the coefficient values here about our actual conclusions. In addition, we could keep fitting models and comparing models. So here, this is a simple model with gender. We could start to add other terms into this model. So we could then look at gender uh, we could look at number of accounts, we could look at region, things like that, and start to understand these relationships between the different variables. We'll come back to that idea. So we'll come back to this and we actually do have a, some, many of you proposed looking at the uh, relationship between sales amount and marketing exposure. That turns out to be a little bit more complicated relationship in this data, but we'll come back to that in, uh, in a session here in just a bit. Let's turn our attention now to data science algorithms and analytics, uh, analytic methods. So we're gonna talk now just about the general field of machine learning, what those different models are, and we'll also think about how do we know when to use which one to solve our problem. There is a methodology to this. Um, there's some variation in the, in the methodology. There's different choices that you can choose here, different pathways you can choose, but there definitely is a methodology um, that we can start from here and a way to get started down this path. So you've probably heard or encountered the term machine learning. And you might have uh, heard these terms associated along with it as well. Unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. We're gonna focus on unsupervised and supervised learning types as our main focus to get started here. 
Reinforcement learning is the use of machine learning in a kind of back and forth with the algorithm where we train the algorithm to select actions that maximize a success or a gain or minimize a cost. It's kind of like playing a game and you reward the algorithm at stages along the way. It's also a very successful technique, but we're not gonna cover it in depth here. So let's talk mainly about supervised versus unsupervised machine learning. In essence, Unsupervised learning tries to extract patterns without much human intervention. Supervised learning tries to fit rules and equations or curves to the data. Supervised learning defines a target variable that needs to be predicted or estimated by applying a supervised learning algorithm using a predictor and in, uh, independent variables features and that target. So just like the linear regression that we just did, those two simple examples of linear regression, that's an example of supervised learning. We have a target, we had sale amount, so we knew what the actual value was, and we then wanted to understand the relationship between that sale amount and maybe another variable like gender. Classification and regression, like we just demonstrated, are examples of supervised learning algorithms. These supervised learning algorithms are built on top of mathematical formulas with some kind of predictive capacity. So the regression example is just one case, one kind of supervised learning. There's many other kinds of supervised learning algorithms. We'll look at a map of them here in just a second. Unsupervised learning is the opposite, as it sounds. With unsupervised learning, we don't have the concept of a target value that we're trying to find or estimate. We don't have labeled output. So we just have the data, but we don't have a target. One classic example of unsupervised learning is clustering, something you're probably all uh, already familiar with. If you're looking at your data and you're wondering if there's structure in your data, you're wondering if your customers fall into certain groups, but you don't know what those groups are and you don't know how many groups there may be, that's an unsupervised learning problem. Some of the most popular or most well-known supervised machine learning algorithms are decision trees, random forests, k-nearest neighbors, naive bays, support vector machines, and regression, as we just talked about. So simple linear regression, multiple regression, uh, weighted regression, many other quantile regression, many, many different types of regression. Now regression is a kind of special technique here because it's both inferential statistics and can be applied in the machine learning context as well, and it's useful in both. Classification examples of supervised learning are where we're trying to, we have our output that is discrete or nominal or categorical. So if we're trying to predict a yes or no output, did sales happen or did they not happen? Is this a low birth weight baby or is this a high birth weight baby? Is this spam or is it not spam? Is this fraud or not fraud? These are all examples of classification. And from one of the uh, questions that uh, one of you proposed earlier, if we were looking at uh, project costs that were 30% higher versus projects that weren't, that's a classification problem. Unsupervised machine learning algorithms are things like k-means clustering, hierarchical clustering, Gaussian mixture models, and things that fall in the realm of dimensionality reduction, such as principal component analysis or manifold learning. 
let's look at a map here from a uh, very popular machine learning toolkit in uh, on the Python side of things called Scikit-Learn. So I'll share this link here in the window in a minute. Uh, sorry, I go to this page all the time. Of course, now I can't find it. Um, Scikit-Learn. There we go. Okay, this is the uh, machine learning map here for Scikit-Learn. So this is really nice. This is from the the authors of Scikit-Learn. Um, uh, these are the people who wrote these algorithms and designed them. This is kind of a pathway through the machine learning algorithms of Forest that's out there. Um, a way to get you started with knowing which is the right technique that might apply to your problem. It's kind of like a game. It's kind of like shoots and ladders or snakes and ladders, if you know that game. You start here and you start to work through your question. Do you have more than 50 samples or more than 50 data points? If you don't, go get more data. Machine learning is going to do better with more data. If you do, are you trying to predict a category? If the answer is yes, and you have labeled data, you're working with supervised learning, then you're in this blob up here. This is the domain of where you're gonna be looking for an appropriate technique to solve your problem. If you're not predicting a category, but you're predicting a quantity, a continuous outcome, then you're in a regression technique here. And these are the kinds of regression techniques that you might choose to use to solve your problem. If you don't have labeled data, then you might be doing unsupervised learning. So this diagram here can be split kind of from top to bottom in terms of supervised classification and regression here are both supervised learning frameworks, clustering and dimensionality reduction on the bottom here are unsupervised learning frameworks. Now notice here, I just wanna direct your attention to the pathway where you can start. You can go through here, you're predicting a quantity. No, you're just looking, you're trying to predict structure. You can end up at tough luck. And actually there's a couple different ways you can end up at tough luck here. So there's a few different ways you can end up at tough luck. Machine learning isn't a magic bullet. It doesn't solve every problem. There's a lot of hype around it, and this is where I kind of let the air out of the tires a little bit here. There's a lot of hype about it. There's a lot of great stuff that it can do, but it doesn't solve every problem. So just be aware of that. Just because uh, you're using machine learning doesn't mean there will necessarily be a solution to your problem. Within here then, you can see as we start to get into these domains of classification and regression, there's more detailed recommendations based on the kind of data that you're looking at or the kind of problem um, that you're trying to solve. So are you looking at text data? Then maybe you're gonna use a naive Bayes classifier. And there's reasons that certain algorithms perform better or worse with certain kinds of data. In this case, naive Bayes performs really well with the sparse matrices that we create from text data. If you have less than 100,000 samples, you might try a support vector classifier first. That's because um, once we get more than 100,000 samples, support vector classifiers slow down a lot and you may have to look for a different technique. So depending on what your problem is, depending on what kind of data you have, this can prompt you to try certain algorithms first. We often try many different kinds of algorithms, many different kinds of models when we're trying to solve a problem. That's part of the expertise that you will develop as a data scientist. So eventually, you'll just have to take my word for it, you'll develop a knowledge and expertise around your data about what kind of algorithms are appropriate and work with it. 
when you're learning, you can ask people who have fit problems, uh, uh, fit machine learning models, problems that are similar to yours, and that will give you uh, a way to advance forward as well. This isn't saying that this is the way you have to proceed, that you have to do a support vector classifier first and then naive Bayes. You can choose your own path through here. This is just one suggested way. This is the author of a machine learning library, so he has a lot of insight. This is the way he thinks about what he tries first. Support vector machine and support vector classifier are, yes, they're interchangeable terms here. So we can use support vector machines for both regression and classification problems. When we say support vector classifier, we mean more specifically the one that's used for classification. Clustering is that unsupervised learning pattern. That's where we want to do uh, the classic example here is customer segmentation. We have a group of customers. We think they fall into three or five or 10 different distinct groups. We can do clustering to see if we can map those theoretical groups into uh, dimensions that we already have. So into descriptive sets. Are those customers who are more in the Northeast who buy more um, who spend more on heating oil than customers in the South, for example. That's a kind of too simple example, but you get the idea. Um, are customers of one region or of one demographic type distinguished from customers um, with other buying patterns? Choosing the right algorithm. So we just went through that map, but here's some more information on that. If we're trying to find the probability of an event or predict a value based on existing horizontal, op historical, sorry, observations, look at supervised learning algorithms. If you're dealing with discrete nominal or categorical variables, those terms are all interchangeable. Things like true, false, small, medium, large, then you're gonna use a classification algorithm. If you're dealing with a continuous numerical variable like cost or different in costs or sales amount, then you need to go with regression. But again, as we sort of work through mentally, we could simplify that difference in costs down to a binary variable. We could turn that and say, is it above this threshold, yes or no? Then that turns it into a classification problem. If you want to let the machine categorize data into a number of groups, you need to go with clustering algorithms. Some more vocabulary here. When you get into machine learning, you do have to uh, learn some new vocabulary here. So this is part of what uh, the words that you'll be dealing with. When we talk about machine learning or data science and statistics, features are the variables that are used in making predictions. They're also called predictors or independent variables. They're the inputs to your model. A feature is similar to a spreadsheet's column some kind of property, some kind of trait of your customer, gender, marketing exposures, number of accounts, things like that. Those are our features or potential features. That value that we're trying to predict based on those features is referred to as the target. In regression modeling, we often call that the response or the outcome or the dependent variable. So again, there's a lot of uh, synonyms here, there's a lot of overlapping terms. That's just based on the different fields that these have emerged from. This is our output of our model. An observation or a sample is the registered value of a particular variable, a feature like temperature and an individual uh, or an individual product's price or something like that. So that's a sample or observation. It's like the row of a table or a record. 
another word for observations, samples, or examples. We sometimes use vector notation to represent observations. So if we abstractly refer to in our sales data, we've got marketing exposure, gender, region, X1, X2, we can abstractly just call all of those X1, X2, X3, all of our predictor variables. And in a more compact way to represent all of that, we may refer to them as bold-faced capital X. That represents a vector. So some of what this notation comes from is linear algebra, and you may see it um, represented in that way. So the bold face X references a matrix or an array of arrays. So each of these is more than one value here. These are, you can think of this as all the columns, the column of marketing exposure here, or the column of number of accounts, or the column of gender. And in a compact way, you can represent those as bold face X. The label or the target is the value that you assign to the observation of what you're trying to predict. You can have labeled and unlabeled observations. The former again are mostly used in classification. The latter are found in clustering. In classification, labeled examples are used to train the model. After that, the trained model is fed unlabeled observations to try to have the model infer or guess the labels of those new unseen observations. So some examples of labels might be uh, software defects. So is this a major or a minor defect? Maybe a trading recommendation, buy, sell, or hold, an email category, spam or non-spam. Categorical labels can be binary. So it's very common that we have things that are yes or no, spam or not spam, fraud or no fraud. Or we can have multi-class labels. They have more than one value, small, medium, or large. That step up from the binary class to a multi-class is a step up in an order of complexity, and we need different techniques to work with that. Features can be of two types. So we can have continuous or categorical. Categorical features in turn are divided into nominal and ordinal. Categorical features that are nominal are ones that have no inherent order to them, red, green, blue. If that categorical feature does have an order to it, small, medium, and large, and that's an ordinal categorical feature. Continuous features represent something that can be physically or theoretically measured on a scale, an interval scale or in numeric values. Things like blood pressure, the size of a black hole, speed of a vehicle, humidity, these are all continuous features. They may have a scale that starts at zero or they may not. If we have a continuous outcome, if our target is continuous, then we are working with regression models. Regression models have that continuous feature output and we learn and predict and help answer types of questions like given past sales, what are the expected sales figures for next month? Very much like our sale amount regression that we're working through as well. Categorical features, again, that can be subdivided into ordinal or nominal, like a hurricane category, gender, security threat level, car types. Uh, these can be illustrated with things like the suits of a, a playing card, hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs. But within the suits of a deck of playing cards, the ranks of the cards are ordered 
ace, two, three, four, etc. to jack, queen, king. So that's the difference there between nominal and ordinal categories. Okay, let's um, turn our attention now back to this idea of choosing the right analytic approach. And what I want you to do here is I'm gonna uh, walk you through this and then we're gonna take your questions that you have been working on and you're gonna think about which do you think is going to be the right analytical approach for your question. This is, can be tough here and sometimes there's more than one answer, but let's think about this as, again here. So there's a lot of options when it comes to choosing an analytic approach to solve a business problem. How do you know which one you should pick? Let's review those options and then we'll pick an analytic approach for different business scenarios. So the big overview picture here is, do we want to use descriptive or inferential statistics? If it's inferential statistics, if it's something like prediction or association, then what is my target of inference or my goal? If you're trying to do something like quantify relationships between parameters, how much does gender influence sale amount? Do men buy more than women? Questions like that trying to quantify that relationship between an income and a target. In that case, you want to use something like parametric models like regression. If you're trying to accurately predict new values based on observed values, then you want to use a machine learning approach. If you're just trying to find groups of similar observations in your data, that's going to be clustering or dimensionality reduction. Okay, so just diving a little bit deeper in here, descriptive versus inferential. If we're interested in describing what's already been observed, so just the past data, we can simply rely on descriptive analytics. This is what the data analyst generally does. So we're just looking at past data. We're just saying what happened. Everything is known and observed. We don't put confidence intervals around it. There's no uncertainty around it because we can measure it. We have the data. We see what it is. We're just reporting on that past sample. This is like a post-mortem exam. This is summary statistics, exploratory data analysis techniques. We could still be looking at relationships here, but we're looking at relationships of what happened in the past. That's descriptive stats. Inferential statistics here is if we're interested in using that observed sample, that past data, to make broader statements about the data that we haven't seen yet. This is the realm of inferential modeling and machine learning. When we do this, we have uncertainty in our predictions and our estimates. Often we represent those with something called confidence intervals. We think this is the answer, plus or minus this amount. So if we're trying to use that past data and we're trying to make a statement about the future or more general data, right? We often only have a sample set sample of a certain amount of data, but we're trying to expand from that data to, let's say, the general population, then that's inference. It can either be forecasting out into the future, or it can be trying to expand to unseen data. That's inferential statistics. Now, within inferential statistics, if you're interested in understanding the relationships between variables, if you wanna know, does X influence Z? By what amount? But is that a positive or a negative relationship? Is that working together with another variable? Is that being defeated by another variable? 
if I want to put a formula around it? All those kinds of questions that really are going to what are the drivers of a business problem? That is something like a linear model or a regression technique. That's parametric modeling that's going to give you that kind of explainability and answers here. The output is summarized at the shape of the relationships between the variables. How is marketing exposure related to sales? We're going to do that model here in a minute. If you're interested in accurately predicting some outcome variable as a function of the observed inputs, then pick a machine learning technique. The output is predictions, or a summary of how good those predictions are. The relationships captured by the model may be hard to explain. This is what we refer to as a black box. One of the downsides of machine learning is that you don't have that same explainability of how X leads to Y. But that's okay because your goal here was only prediction. Predicting fraud, for example, so we can shut down a credit card. If you're interested in identifying subgroups in your data without a specific outcome in mind, you should use clustering techniques. Now, one thing about machine learning and predictive models here is you can make that prediction with confidence, and we'll talk about this in more depth here uh, in a minute, if you think your future data is coming from the same population as your past data. So if you think nothing is changing in your mix of customers, then you can have reasonable confidence that your predictions are pretty good. But again, if something changes, if a new store opens up, or a new kind of truck is released, and the future is different than the past, then you can't use machine learning. That's a tricky concept there. That can be tricky because we don't obviously know what the future is gonna bring here. Okay, so for your question, your hypothetical question that you wanna answer with a data science problem, do you think that you want to use inferential statistics like regression modeling to understand the relationships between variables? Are you trying to understand drivers? Are you more interested in accurately predicting an outcome? In that case, you're primarily looking at machine learning. Or are you trying to identify groups in your data then in that case, you're looking at clustering. So take a few moments to do this. We'll take a break at the end of this, so 10 minutes to think about, for your question, are you trying to understand the relationships between variables? What are you, what are you trying to get at in your question? Are you mainly interested in making predictions? Or are you trying to identify groups in your data? Or are you just doing descriptive stats? I guess I should add that in here if you're just looking at past data. Probably not. If you're in this course, you're probably interested in, in either regression modeling or machine learning here. Um, but can you narrow down what you think is the specific uh, kind of data that you would apply? And again, if your goal here is prediction, if you think it's machine learning, you're basing it on the assumption, a pretty strong assumption, that the future is gonna look like the past. As we are all painfully aware of now, that's not always true. <laughs> there are curveballs that come at us from all different directions. Work on this, write down those notes for your question. I'm gonna back up the slides here. Uh, and, uh, go back to that uh, slide set here. So inferential stats, machine learning or clustering. Now there may be dimensions of your question that can be answered in different ways, right? As you start to articulate this, maybe part of what you wanna do is a relationship and maybe some other part of it is some kind of prediction, right? Maybe you want to understand the drivers, but then you want to say, well, if I change those drivers in certain ways, 
how will that impact my outcome? And then you're getting into the realm of using modeling for experimentation, doing uh, sensitivity analyses here. Try to articulate that question in mind here and think about what kind of technique you think at this point or techniques you, you believe would be appropriate for your question. Now, you're not going to have to make this decision unless you're a skilled data scientist. That's what you're, if you're someone who's working with data scientists, um, if that's going to be your role, that's what you're going to do here. You're going to work in concert with them to make this decision. And again, it could be more than one kind of model. It could be more than one kind of technique. But this will go into back into your project plan, your data science plan. As you articulate this, you're going to say, well, I think we need a regression model to answer this part of the question. And then I think we need a machine learning model to answer this part of the question. So we'll give you five minutes to work on that here, and then we'll go, uh, we'll take another quick break. So at uh, half past the hour, we'll take another 15 minute break. Uh, and then we'll keep uh, moving forward with the material, okay? So work on that, and then we'll come back in a minute here. Um, we'll take a break right at um, half past, 15 minutes, and we'll come back at 45 past the hour to keep working through the material. But think carefully, Write this down on your piece of paper here as you're evolving your question.
Hey, all, you can go ahead and uh, ask questions in the chat here. Um, so if you're raising your hand, go ahead and just uh, put your question in the chat and um, let me know. I'm, we're having some discussion in the chat here. Uh, maybe you're aware of it. Um, but I'll talk about some of these um, questions when we come back to the uh, main discussion here. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. We're going to take a little break here, a little 15 minute break. Um, I'm going to try and move positions again to get better audio. So uh, I will do that. And hopefully when we come back here, everything will be sorted out. Thanks so much for your patience on this. You know, we're um, working in different situations and just trying to um, subject to the winds of Wi-Fi, as it were. <laughs> anyway. Um, 15 minute break, we'll come back at 45 and I'll answer some of these questions generally to the group and talk through them as well. Thanks.
Hi all, we're back and we're going to keep working through the material here. Um, so what we have remaining this afternoon is we're going to keep walking through this um, notebook, uh, talking about a particular modeling problem, just that sale amount. Again, the idea here is just to give you of the kinds of stages of a data science workflow, see what it actually looks like in a simplified way here in your notebook, um, see a uh, linear model looks like complicate the issue a little bit here. This machine learning vocabulary as well. Um, we'll keep going through that, talking through the vocabulary here, and then we'll also um, reserve some time for questions at the end. So keep, um, keep asking questions, keep formulating more questions, and we'll save some um, class time at the end here to make sure that we answer those questions. See here if I could. Okay. Sorry about the audio problems. I don't know what's going on. I've had a pretty good connection, of course, today. Seems to not be doing that. So just let me know. I'll keep trying to find a good place to do this. I'm very close to the, the Wi Fi, so again, I don't know what's going on here, but um, let me know. I'll, I'll keep trying to solve it, and I apologize for the um, for some of the audio issues here. Okay, a, a couple of questions here. Um, uh, one of you was asking about this this idea that we had about looking for project costs, and we're looking for overages in product costs. Is that an inferential regression modeling approach, or is it a machine learning approach? And the answer here might be that it's a little bit of both. That understand the relationships, what causes these overages in costs, right? You wanna figure out, you're trying to say, what's 30% more costs, and you wanna figure out what in those variables, those inputs that you have, those features that you have, what might be associated with those overages in costs. And with a regression model, in your case, since you're looking at a binary outcome, if we're looking at the who's 30% more or not, that would be a logistic regression that you would use as a technique there. In addition, knowing that those features might be associated with in increased costs, you might also be able to distinguish how they're associated, how much of uh, some kind of input is contributing to that overage of costs. So that's something that a logistic regression, that kind of relationship can give you there. But then understanding the relationships, you might then want to take it another step and make predictions. So it might be that you're looking at both kinds of models here. You then want to take, put in the features that you have and predict whether you think there's going to be an overage of 30% or more in those uh, projects. So that's a great example of using both of these techniques, both kinds of modeling here, both kinds of inferential statistics, both a regression model and perhaps a machine learning model to answer that question. Let's look at this. Uh, nonlinearity, uh, this marketing exposure variable in our sale amount. So this is a question that we started off the morning with here. Our, uh, our sale amount, average sale outcome that we're looking at, and one of the natural questions was how might marketing exposure be associated with that? Well, what, what can we do with that? We can do our explore tours and look at a graph of marketing by sale amount. And when we do that, we're also putting on a linear model onto this graph. So we're putting on a line of best fit. Uh-oh, that relationship doesn't look great. According to this graph, more money that we, the, the more ads that a customer sees. So as marketing exposure increases, sale amount 
goes down. Average sale amount goes down, right? The trend of this line is a downward slope. That's probably not what would be expected to see or not what we hoped to see. And we're gonna go have a back and talk to our, our marketing department and say, what's going on here? Now, there might be something more complex going on in the model. I mean, this doesn't look like a strictly straight line relationship. There's kind of curvature, curvature here on the upper edge of this data. We can't see because the, the data is pretty dense, quite see what's going on, but certainly in terms of placing in an exploratory way, a linear model on top of this, there does seem to be a downward trend. And we can calculate that correlation here. And the correlation seems to be slightly negative. So this kind of correlation, this Pearson correlation that we're looking at is another measure of a linear relationship between two continuous predictors. So this is negative. This is also telling us there's a negative effect here. So it looks like it in the graph, we can test it. And one way that we can test it, statistically test this, is with a linear model. So we can do a simple linear model of sale amount as our outcome, our Y variable, marketing exposure as our feature, or target variable. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm talking, so I think that, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. There seem to be some sound issues. Okay, great. So here's our simple linear regression. I think people are confirming that they can hear. Um, here's our simple linear regression of sale amount as the outcome, marketing exposure as the income. Here's our negative coefficient. So again, I'm kind of hand waving over the interpretation of linear models here, um, but I'm giving you a little bit of information. One way to interpret this coefficient here is for every unit increase in marketing exposure. So for each additional time a customer sees an advertisement, average sales go down by 22 units, whatever it is here, perhaps $22. So again, confirming that negative relationship. Our p-value here is statistically significant. At a 0 0.05 level, this is a significant finding. So there is a downward linear trend according to the data that we have. Now, is this a highly predictive model? Not so much. At the moment, our r-squared is not that high, not much more than zero here. So this is a model, it might not be a great. There's a famous aphorism here that all models are wrong, some are useful. Think about that one for a minute. All models are wrong, some are useful. So what does that mean? It means that part of the reason that we're modeling here Part of the reason that we're trying to answer these questions is for utility. We're trying to answer, does there seem to be a relationship between marketing exposure and sale amount? What is that relationship? Is it positive or negative? Okay, so maybe we need a more complex model to understand this relationship in a better way. And again, I'm trying to sort of simulate the thinking process of a data scientist here. Now, data scientists have rules and tricks under their belt. One of them is making a more complex model in a variety of different ways. What if instead of a straight line, we look to see if a curved line would fit this model better? Maybe that will give us a better fit to the model. There's ways that we can do that visually, and of course, there's ways we can do that computationally. This is the way 
curved lines visually to the model. And what we're looking at here, this is a, an adjustment we've made in our plotting method here. We've asked it to do what's called a low S curve here. And we're comparing this to the straight line model and seeing if this new model, which has more capacity, more flexibility, curves. And indeed it does. So the, this hints to us that maybe we need some other kind of relationship here beyond just a straight line relationship between the target and the feature. Now, we can fit this kind of line. This kind of doesn't look like just a simple curve. This kind of line looks like it has several segments to it. Looks like it's kind of downward here and then it changes angle and then it changes again. There's a flexible kind of curve that we can uh, create in a model like this called a spline curve. This is a pretty advanced technique. So if you've never heard of this before, that's totally okay. This is a, a I would call it an advanced modeling technique, but this is what's called a spline curve. Essentially, what we're saying is we're going to fit three separate little models to our data um, in different segments and examine the relationship between. Now, I'm sorry, I'm just fast forwarding a little bit here. We can specify that those segments are either curved or that they are straight lines. So this orange line that you're looking at is a spline model. It has three segments to it but we're restricting those three segments to be linear. And that looks more or less like the low S curve that we had before. So this is what we call a more capacious model. It has more capacity. It can fit our data a little bit better and give us a better model. But that still is a downward trend here. Whichever one of these models, this kind of sine wave that we're looking at or the straight line, Still, the overall effect looks like a downward trend from, the, from reading from left to right. So we still have that same overall picture here of marketing exposure being negatively associated with sales. The model. So perhaps we go back to the marketing department and we talk to them about this and they say, oh yes, those ads were targeted towards women. Okay, well that's useful information for us to have. We probably would have known about that ahead of time, but let's just pretend that we didn't. We're gonna go back now and say that we need to include gender in our model as well in some kind of way. So how do we include gender in the model as well? Well, we can go back to our exploratory data analysis and remember that loop that we had of transformation and visualization and modeling. That's what we're in right now. We're going over and through that loop several times, trying to understand these relationships in the model. Our main question here is, what's the relationship between marketing exposure and sales? It turns out that may be more complex than we first thought. So we can take our linear model plot that we had before, and we can separate it into two columns by gender. So we can make what's exposed in the plot. Now, when we, we see that the relationship for men stays approximately flat. This line is pretty much a flat line, but the trend line for women is increasing. So as women see more ads, they tend to spend more money. We have two different curves here, one rising, one essentially flat. There's a couple of different terms for this. Uh, the main term that we want to call this is interaction. So when we have two variables that are working in concert to affect the outcome, that's what we call interaction in our model. In other words, it's not just one or the other. It's not just marketing exposure. It's not just gender, but there's a complex relationship. Women who see more ads, spend more money. For men, the relationship, men spend less money and it doesn't matter how many ads they see. It's a more complex relationship than can be described either by just the relationship between gender and sales or between marketing and sales. It's an interaction. They are reacting differently depending on how many ads they see and the gender of the customer. 
we can code that we have the idea of a relationship like that. We can put it into our model. We do it with what's called a, an interaction term, a mul multiplicative term here. And I'm getting a little bit technical. This is, again, a little bit more advanced. But hopefully the idea is clear here is this often happens in real life that it's not just one variable at a time that's affecting the outcome, but it's several variables in complex ways. It's called an We can create a model direction term in it. Our R squared is higher than it's been to date. So this is at the moment our best model. We can make predictions from that model. So the way to make predictions from this model is we make a dummy data set of marketing exposure zero through 15 and gender male or female. So it looks like this data set and we pass it through the model and we get predicted sale amounts. Then with those predicted sale amounts, we can make a visualization that looks like this. So these are our models. This is the orange model here is for men, the blue model is for women, and this adheres to those curves that we saw in the data when we did the exploratory data analysis. Again, this is called interaction here, where we have two different responses based on two variables working together. This is a scenario. Interaction is something that's difficult to detect. You often know about it because of expertise in your field. You have historical data. You know that terms tend to interact together. That's why you know about interaction and you might guess to put it in your model. Otherwise, discovering interaction is a lot of exploratory data analytics, looking at variables two at a time, three at a time, and trying to notice patterns in their responses. But the idea here, again, is just to give you an example of the kinds of thought processes that we go through with the data science workflow. And the reason you might choose to do this kind of modeling is because you're trying to understand this relationship. You want to know how does marketing exposure affect men or for women. Then, to understand those relationships, you can experiment or you can make predictions. You can say, okay, now that I have a female uh, with uh, a male with zero marketing exposure, what's my predicted sale amount there? What about a female with zero marketing exposure? What's my predicted sale amount versus a female with who's seen 10 advertisements? There's my predicted average sale amount. Hold on one moment here, please. Hi all, I apologize for all of that. Um, I was in several different positions here. I'm right by the router now. Um, we're all, uh, there's several of us working here and we're all getting messages that the um, connection is unstable. I don't know what's going on. It seems like it's a nice day outside, um, but I do apologize for that. We'll just do the best we can here and continue forward. So um, hopefully uh, all will be good from here forward, fingers crossed. Splines. Here in this model, this is called a spline model. These are these segments of the model. So uh, as I scroll back up here, this is taking the model and these splines refer generally to types of curves here, but in this case, they refer to the different segments that are in this model. Again, spline, spline modeling here is an advanced technique 
Um, but the idea that I really wanted to hammer home there was the idea of that interaction. Interaction is something that we can include in both uh, regression models and in uh, machine learning models here. Okay, so what is a model? Well, as we've seen, we've worked through several models here. A model is that formula. It's an algorithm. It's a prediction function that establishes a relationship between features and our output labels. A model is trained to predict or make inference on labels or predict values. When we're talking about modeling now, Modeling can encompass both regression models and machine learning models. What we're talking about now in the context of this slide is more of machine learning models. When we talk about machine learning models, there's two major life cycles, which is the model fitting, the model training, where, is where we let the model learn from our labeled observations. maybe setting several models, maybe tuning those models, adjusting what we call hyperparameters to get the best model. And then when we arrive at our best candidate model, the next major life cycle phase of the model is inference, is making those predictions. How do we know if we have a good model or not? Well, we evaluate the model and there's different kinds of metrics, different ways we evaluate the model, again, based on the data that we have and based on the model that we're using. One way that we can analyze a model is by how accurate it is, how good are its predictions, how close are its predictions to our targets. Remember, we have targets, we have past data, so we can compare predictions of our model to that past data and quantify how close they are. For a classification model, a common measure of a classification model's accuracy is the error rate in which the model gives wrong predictions. So just imagine for a minute that you have an outcome that is yes or no. An email is spam or it is not spam. And you're training a model to try and classify emails. You're trying to make an email filter. You want your email program to look at the email coming in and automatically put it in a spam box if it classifies as a spam. Well, what is it looking at for that classification of spam? It might be looking at the domain where the email originated. So you might be looking at words in the subject line of the email. It might be looking at the body of the email itself. It might be looking at graphics or animations inside the emails. There could be lots of potential features um, inside that email that it's using to predict spam or not spam. So you've encoded all those features, you've built the model, now you want to test it out, and you're going to see that your model will predict correctly sometimes and predict incorrectly other times. So you're going to have true positives and true negatives, but you're also going to have what are called false positives and false negatives, where the model predicts that it's spam, but it's not spam, or it fails to predict that it's spam when it actually is. And in the ideal world, but if you have a per perfect model, you may have overfit your model, and we'll talk about that idea next. For classification scenarios, the way that we evaluate how well a model performing, one way that we can evaluate is with something called a confusion matrix. And this is a table, a two by two table 
that counts up the number of true positives. These are the correct predictions. It's a spam message. And we predicted it's a spam message. Patients who are classified as having the disease. True negatives. A message is predicted as not spam, and it is not spam. Patients are correctly classified as not having disease, as healthy, and they don't have it. False positives, which is also called type 1 error. Uh, that's where we label a message as spam, but it actually isn't. Or in a, our a medical scenario here, some healthy patients have wrongfully been classified as being ill. Or false negatives, type 2 error, where uh, we've missed spam and it's gotten through. It's actually a spam message, but we predicted it wasn't. Okay, now, what is worse? To predict someone has cancer when they don't have it, or to miss a prediction, say that they don't have cancer when they actually do? Which is a worse scenario? So which kind of mistake is worse here? To predict someone has cancer when they don't have it, or to miss a diagnosis and say that they don't have cancer when they actually do. A lot of you are applying false negatives, right? What's inherent in that idea of false negative? A lot of you are saying that false negative was worse here, but why is it worse? Why is a false negative worse? It's worse because of some idea of cost, right? Cost in terms of what it costs to miss that diagnosis, right? There may be an increased cost. It may be the cost of, of worse illness, maybe a cost of life. You've missed the diagnosis, the person, the disease progresses, and now it gets worse for the patient. But that's weighed against there's also costs with a false positive, right? You're potentially giving someone medication to treat some, something that they don't have, chemotherapy or some other kind of medicine, but they don't actually have the condition. So that also has a negative impact on them. But we weigh in our mind the idea of these costs. In your classification scenarios, those costs could have different weights to them. Here's someone who's um, replying that false positives might be worse. Again, it really is context dependent. Sometimes it depends what the, what the cost is. I think most people in, a, in the cancer example, I think most people think a misdiagnosis, missing that classification is worse because the disease will progress and get worse and you've missed it. But again, in different scenarios, there can be a different balance between those two. We can imagine that there's different costs associated with a false positive versus a false negative. This is what a binary classification confusion matrix can look like. So we have predicted class, yes or no, true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative, and actual class, yes or no. thinking about optimizing your model. So your, let's say, imagine that you're trying to make a classification model. You're trying to predict class uh, cost overruns for projects. Is it worse that um, you miss a case or is it worse that you identify a case that you think will have a cost overrun, but it actually doesn't? Which is worse? Which is the higher cost? in that case, which is a worse outcome. Now, this is a, a tail. Again, these are just counts here. These are just counts here that are in each of these cells. From this confusion matrix, we can look at um, a really great diagram of this on Wikipedia. So this is probably the most comprehensive diagram that I know of on Wikipedia for a confusion matrix here. Let 
Okay. So here, our confusion matrix, our true positives and true negatives, false negatives and false positives. Be careful when you're looking at confusion matrices from different software. Sometimes these cells are in different arrangements. Sometimes it's reflected. False positive will be up here. False negative uh, up in the corner, things like that. So just, just be aware of that and be careful about this. What's also important in confusion matrices when you're looking at them is how you set up the problem, what's considered success or what's considered failure, of course. That's going to flip this as well. But around the confusion, a lot of that we derive from the confusion matrix. So these are terms that you have also probably heard of in a machine learning context. Things like accuracy up here in the upper right, which is the number of true positives and the number of true negatives over all of the guesses, over the total population, that's accuracy. Accuracy, you write guesses, have you made? How many ones have you put? Uh, my, I'm still getting connections about my inner connection. I'm right by the machine here. I don't know what's going on. So sorry about that. Um, accuracy is one measure. Some other measures are things like sensitivity or recall. This is the number of true positives out of those that actually were positive. Or specificity, the numbers that uh, you predict as negative out of those of actually. And there's some other more complex scores like this one, the F1 score tries to balance true positives and true negatives. So what metric you decide to use is again going to depend on your particular scenario and what those costs are, how they are related to each other. That's something, again, that you will often look for expertise. Someone who's been working with this problem will say, this is the particular metric or metrics that we want to use to judge this model. Now, when we set up a machine learning model, uh, when we begin the process, we split the model into something called uh, training and test data sets. We don't use the same data for training our model that we use for testing it. Um, I did that in the simple regression models that I did uh, in the workbook example, but if I was working on a larger problem, I would partition my data in this way to divide it into training and test data sets. Why do we do this? Well, remember that we only have past data. We only have the data that we've seen, but if we're using machine learning, we want to look into the future. We want to try to simulate looking into the future. How do we do that? The way that we do that is we take a portion of our data, typically 20 or 30% of our data. We split it off from the rest of our data and that becomes our testing data set. And we put it off to the side and we don't look at it until we've settled on a model. This then simulates for us future unseen data. We fit the model, we fit several models, we tune our models on our training data set. And there's a variety of techniques that we use to get the best model out of that. But we reserve that 20 to 30% of our data for testing because that gives us confidence. That's the only way that we can simulate the future. And that gives us confidence that our model will perform well with new unseen data. Very important that we very strictly put that data aside and that we don't mix it back in with the training data or leak information from testing data back into training. If we do, we won't have confidence that our model can perform well. One thing we can additionally do with our model is we can take, uh, and this is uh, validation or cross-validation. There's a couple of different ways that you can do it here, but we can take our training data and additionally subdivide it into smaller partitions of data. This is a technique called k-fold cross-validation. K meaning the number of sub-partitions that we make. If we do 
five or 10, these are kind of common numbers here, five-fold cross-validation, 10-fold cross-validation, things like that. We divide that training data into smaller folds and we hold out that data, that validation set, and work on the rest of the data. Then we put that fold back in, take out another fold, and continue to train on that data. And we repeat that for all of the folds that we have, and then calculate the performance. We average the performance of all those different smaller models that we made across the folds. And this can get us better performance. This is also a technique that we use for what's called hyperparameter tuning. So as we settle in on our models and are trying to turn uh, dials on the models and get them to be the best performing model that we can, um, this is a technique for that as well. We're going to keep going back and forth between data visualization and exploratory data analysis. So we'll go back and forth between the two. Again, we're in that loop of transformation, visualization, and modeling. And we keep cycling through as we're trying to make several models and arrive at the best model. The process of creating or transforming predictors from the raw data is called feature engineering or feature extraction. So when we're doing things here like scaling our data, normalizing it, creating synthetic features based on the original data, dropping features that might have high correlation with other ones that we already have. This is all in the realm of feature engineering. And what we're trying to get down to here is what are the relevant features? We can have very large data sets that have lots and lots of potential features in them. We wanna know what are the pertinent ones. Adding additional features means a lot of extra dimensions potentially a lot more computational time. If some of our variables have uh, very large, much larger values than others, we may have skewed distances where smaller variables don't have any overall, uh, any influence on the overall distance, right? That idea of, some variables may be on a binary scale, zero or one, others might be on the thousands or millions, and the ones that are on a larger scale may overwhelm the smaller one. That's commonly when we do this data normalization or scaling technique, min-max scaling, or other kinds of transformations here. If we have variables that are correlated with each other, we may create synthetic features out of them. So we might take two variables that share variants, they're correlated, and we add them together in a mathematical way to come up with a new synthetic variable, X3, for example, here. Yeah, so a question here is if you have an example of, if you know revenue and costs, can you figure out profit? Yes, that would be a, a, a feature engineering. That would be a derived feature that you'd make from two other columns that you have. So you have a birth date, you need to calculate age. Or you have a date and you need to calculate um, age of uh, life of employment, something like that. These are all kinds of feature engineering statements. All of this is part of the pre-processing, getting data ready for the model. Now we kind of simplified over this in the example with sale amount, the data, we only used a few features there and the data was on reasonable scales. So we didn't have to do too much of this. But when you're working with uh, machine learning, you often have to transform and prepare your data in many of these different techniques. So all of this is what we refer to as pre-processing the data, the feature engineering, the scaling of the data, um, these are all part of feature engineering. Another part of that feature, uh, of that pre-processing here is uh, one hot encoding. If you have string values or character values in your data, buy, sell, or hold, 
small, medium, or large, that are nominal or ordinal characters. We need to translate these into some kind of numerical representation. The way that we often do this is we use something called one-hot encoding to give each element of the feature a value of one if it is a representative of that category and all other elements a value of zero. Let me show you this on a little, uh, on a little blank page here. So let's say that we have a data set and it has a column in it that has the values mouse, cat, and dog. Right? We've got these categorical variables in our data. Well, if we do a categorical data encoding, categorical data encoding, what it does uh, in most programming languages like Python is it converts these string features into integer representations. So for example, one possible way to encode this numerically is to say, um, We'll just go from top to bottom here. Mouse is represented by one, cat is represented by two, dog is represented by three, and so forth. So now I've re-encoded uh, this string feature into a numerical feature. And then along the way, I keep some kind of mapping table that tells me a one represents a mouse, a two represents a cat, and a three represents a dog. Well, that's one way to solve this problem, but for many machine learning algorithms, if they see an encoding scheme like this, they might think, that's one way of putting it, that a cat is the average of a mouse and a dog. Because cat is a two here, the average of a one and a three is a two. So conceptually, the algorithm doesn't know what these quantities represent. Um, might think this is a numerical quantity. It might think that then a cat is the average of a mouse and dog, whatever that means. Kind of a strange thought there, but that's what it would mean. So what can we do? Well, we can turn this into a different kind of encoding, which is one hot encoding, where we say we're going to have three different uh, columns instead. We're going to have a column that represents if that record is a mouse. So if this record is a mouse, that column will have a one in it. It'll have a zero in the cat column and a zero in the dog column. For the cat, this is not a mouse, so we'll have a zero in that column, a one in the cat column, and a zero in the dog column. For a dog, a zero in the mouse column, a zero in the cat column, a one in the dog column, etc. You get the idea here, right? So it's going to expand this out to one hot or dummy encoding that looks like this. Well, for this matrix of data on the right hand side, these ones and zeros, we have three columns that represent the three unique levels of our data, but we can actually simplify down from this. Um, a mouse here, a one in the mouse columns, mean that both cat and dog have to be zero. So we can actually get rid of one of these columns. This is a linear redundancy. We don't need this because this information is encoded in the other two columns. If it's a one here, the other two have to be zero, so we can get rid of that column. And that's what becomes what we describe as the reference category here. So this is an example. Of this is what we need to do with categorical or string variables in machine learning algorithms in order for them to be interpreted in the model. We have to turn all those categories into unique indicator variables like this. Here's another example of that, buy, sell, and hold. Right? We've mapped those into three unique columns here. Now, when we're fitting machine learning, there's another trade-off that we have to be aware of. 
if we train a model on data that we have, observed data with target, computers are pretty smart and it can learn. And we, if we give it unlimited time and unlimited cycles to train on that data, we could potentially make a very well fitting model, a perfectly fitting model or what we refer to as an overfit model. This is a model that fits our training data very well, but it doesn't generalize to new data. So it fits the data that we've seen very, very well, but when we feed it new data, the unseen data that we have in our test data set, suddenly our model falls apart. That's a, a condition called overfitting and we want to avoid it. It's a problem that plagues machine learning here. This is one of the main reasons that we split our data set into training and test so that we can compare the performance on both of these partitions and balance our model, address this as needed. Underfitting is the opposite problem. And that's when we have a model that's too general, it's too generic, it doesn't really give good predictions, it's too simple. A good model strikes a balance between bias, uh, bias here, that underfitting, and its overreaction to variance. This is called the bias, bias variance trade-off here. And we're looking to balance that in our best fitting models. One way that we can balance bias and variance is high bias is but low variance is we have made predictions and they're all clustered together. So they have low variance, they're all close to each other, but they're not near the target. We haven't hit that bullseye in the middle there. We've got predictions that are, that are close to each other, but they're not showing a lot of variance, but they're off the mark. They're not hitting our target. On the other hand, we can have high variance predictions um, but low bias. So these are all around the target. They're equally spaced around the target, but they're not close to each other, right? So this is another scenario where we have high variance, but low bias. Ideally, of course, we'd like low variance and low bias. We'd like to have all our, our predictions close to the mark with as little variance as possible, but that's rarely the case. We're usually trying to balance between the upper left-hand corner and the lower right-hand corner, this trade-off between uh, low variance and high bias and high variance, low bias. Here's some examples of underfitting and overfitting in a, a regression model. So here we can see that the data is curved, but we fit a straight line to the model. So it's um, not, it's uh, overshooting the data points here on the hand side. It's too high for those. It's, it's uh, overshooting the data here on the left hand side as well. It's undershooting here. So there is a linear trend to this data, but it's not fitting the data that well. We've tried to put, introduce too many polynomial terms. We've tried to make the model too, with too much capacity here, and we're trying to hit every single one of those data points but that's overfitting. It's an overly complex model that doesn't generalize. There's some kind of nice balancing that balances in between the two of those. And that's our best fitting, most useful model here. And the way that we achieve this best fitting model, this uh, by and by variance ratio here by using dimensionality reduction, so reducing those features, choosing the features that we need to put in the model. Another term for that is regularization. So when we put a penalty on our model and we tamp down certain features, that also addresses this bias bias variance relationship. Sorry, I just can't say that word this afternoon. Bias variance relationship here. When we are making linear models, we typically aren't just making 
uh, sorry, linear models or machine learning models, we aren't just typically typically making one model, we are often making a series of models. We make some models, we look at their metrics, like that confusion matrix, we look at things like the precision or the recall or the F1 score, and we may then adjust things in our model. We may try and emphasize a certain feature or remote, remove a certain feature or introduce an interaction or introduce regularization. There's different techniques that we do to try to improve that model and compare it to pre previous models that we, like we did with our, um, our uh, uh, sale amount model. So we went through several different stages of putting different things in the model, different parameters and features in the model. That's a, a simplified way of doing this as well. And we would compare the model based on some metrics, maybe like an R squared here or some other measures of the model, like in our classification models. That's a back and forth uh, approach. Ways to do that computationally, to do that programmatically with stepwise selection. And um, so there are approaches to that. And one of the exciting features in machine learning right now is the effort to make, um, to automate some of this process of fitting many different kinds of models mm -hmm. and figuring out what the best possible model could be. So one example of that here is a product called H2O. This, this is a, uh, oh, let me uh, change something here. About that. Um, this is the H2O here is a uh, commercial company, but there's a free version of this software available. Um, and so I'm using the free version here on my laptop. Uh, and I just want to show this to you as an alternative machine learning toolkit. So we talked a little bit about Scikit-Learn, um, but this is another um, toolkit that has machine learning models in it. I'll go to the website in a minute. I'm just launching this process for the moment here. I have to give it a minute. This is starting a Java process on my machine. I don't have a terribly powerful laptop here, but I um, should be able to get this working here in a second. Okay. Um, part of this toolkit is it can give you a visual interface to working with data and fitting models. So this is a product of theirs. Again, I'm not paid by the company here. I'm just trying to show you an alternative way of um, doing machine learning. Um, this has a web page interface. So in this web page interface, you can upload some data. So this is our just our customer sale uh, data frame here. Customer ID, sale, sale amount. I'm going to specify that the customer ID here is a string, not a numeric variable, but otherwise I'll just leave it as is. It'll parse the file, it'll upload it. It's really just still on my disk here, but it's putting it into a Java kernel that is an engine that's working in the background here. I can look at my data. I can look at individual measures here. Here's my sale amount history. So you can do some data exploration, some validation, and all that kind of stuff here. But the main thing that I want to show you here is this modeling technique that H2O provides, which is called AutoML. And this is trendy in the industry right now. This is the idea of automatic machine learning, where you say, uh, and I haven't split my data set into training. I wouldn't normally do that in practice, but for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna do that here. I say, this is my data. This is my target that I wanna look at, my response column, sale amount. I'm gonna exclude a couple of other variables from the model. I'm gonna leave everything else in here. So region, age, gender, activity, X1, all those other things are gonna go into the model here. I'm just gonna leave all the defaults. I'm gonna tell it that it has a maximum runtime of 360 seconds. And then I'm going to, 
And what this technique is doing, what this product is doing here, is it's now trying to fit many, many different kinds of models. So linear regression models, deep learning models, random forest models, lots of different kinds of models, and automate that process and compare all those models for me. So this is assuming I have good data, the data is clean, I've already pre-cleaned it, I know that all the measures that I've put in there are good to go, and it's trying to take away some of all those different kinds of models. As I, this is kind of a, a trend right now, there's a couple of different products that do something like this in the machine learning world, and you're going to see more of these as well. However, a note of caution here, your best models come from understanding the data. So this is a little bit like um, giving dynamite to a toddler here. You might get results, but if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have a real understanding of these, you're not necessarily that you're gonna get a good model here. If you've put in bad data, remember that principle from early on this morning, garbage in, garbage out. If you put bad data into the, into the model, you're going to get bad results out of this. Even though you might get a fancy model, even though it's going to run here and give you something, it might give you bad results if you don't know what you're doing. But this can also be a useful technique to run through several different kinds of models, different architectures of models in an automated way and perhaps prompt ideas for you. So if you, you are picking up in my voice that I have a little bit of skepticism about that product. That's absolutely true here. I'm interested in this. I think this is, as I said, a trend in the industry and it's worth watching, but I do um, reserve judgment on it for the time being to see um, if it's going to provide us um, advances in modeling. There's lots and lots of work being done in machine learning right now. There's lots of different companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, um, H2O, lots of other companies that are attacking these kinds of problems now. So there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of products coming out. Um, we have a lot to choose from. I just wanted to show this to you as an alternative. This is gonna come up with a solution here in another two minutes. We won't sit around and watch the dial spin here. We'll um, actually, I think, take another quick break. We'll come back after the, um, come back after the break and look at these results and see what it's prompted us. It's going to give us some nice exotic foreign models that we haven't quite covered yet. But the next part of this, the last part of this lecture this afternoon that we're going to talk about is just some vocabulary, random forests, decision trees, random forests, k-means clustering. So the last thing I'm going to run you through here is just a little bit of this vocabulary. These are common machine learning algorithms to orient those are. Um, some of you, I think, are peeling off. That's great. That's totally fine. But I do want to mention uh, a useful book on this is the Python data book. Again, this is, we sort of focus on Python a little bit in this course. This isn't the only way that you can do data science. It's a free book, book online resource for, for um, giving you information about machine learning and how we'll come check that out. Let's take our last break of the afternoon here. So let's take another 15 minute break. We'll come back at the top of the hour. We'll finish up with that vocabulary about decision trees and random forests and clustering. Um, and we'll kind of wrap up and we'll have some time for questions, uh, the remainder of our time here. So just take a quick 15 minute break. We'll come back, we'll wrap this up and, and then we'll have room for additional questions. Thanks so much.
Uh, and when we get back, uh, as we wrap, wrap up at the uh, end of the session this afternoon, uh, we also have a, a survey for you to fill out, and um, JF will share the slide deck with you. Um, so we'll come back and uh, be sure to get those materials before you sign off today. So again, just a quick 15-minute uh, break. I apologize for my uh, internet connection here. It's been really good. I don't know what's going on today. But thank you for your patience, and just a little bit longer to go, and we'll wrap up here. Thanks.
Okay, we're gonna get underway again here, and we're gonna wrap things up pretty soon. Um, the last little bit of information that we just give to you here is we want to walk through a couple of specific algorithms, decision trees, and random um, to just give you that insight onto uh, you know look at, at some uh, individual ones here, see what they look like. Um, also, k-means clustering. It's in a kind of non-technical way here, but if you do want to read about the nitty-gritty, get down and read about the details, the math details of these uh, algorithms, these techniques, you can absolutely do so. And there's two great books that are available for free online. These are kind of the textbooks for machine learning, statistical learning here. Um, the first one is this Introduction to Statistical Learning by Trevor Hasty et al. Um, and this is a great book to start with. Now this is pretty technical, but the other one is even more technical than this, but this is gonna give you, um, it's, you can download the PDF. Um, it's gonna give you all, all details that you wanna know about and then forests and support vector machines and all that good stuff, what they are, how you use them, where you use them, all that kind of stuff. The other book here that's really essential reading is um, this uh, elemental learning. Again, available for free. Yeah, I'm going to disable. Um, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, uh, it's not like a, it's a sunny day outside. It's a little bit windy, but there you go. The magic of technology. Um, there you go. There's the other book, Elements of Statistical Learning there. So um, that will give you some more details. That's really kind of the um, essential reading book here, the textbook, if you will, on machine learning. Um, so both of those are great reads. Um, they do get quite technical, um, math involved, so if that's, um, if, if elements there is, uh, you want something a little bit simpler, try the um, introduction, or, and again, I re recommend Python Data Science Handbook here, another free resource. There's so much great free information online. Um, this is going to be specific to Python here, but it is a very good read as well. And it has a lot of information on machine learning. And I'm going to borrow some of these diagrams as we go through and talk about decision trees and random forests here. So this is the last thing that we're going to do this afternoon. We'll reserve some time for questions. We have materials to share with you and a survey to complete. So. Decision trees. Decision trees are um, decision support algorithms. They're supervised learning process, means that we use a, we have targets there. We have, the way a decision tree works is that we have decision points, we make rules. Um, at each decision point, an event is associated with some consequence, cost or time probability. They're widely used in decision analysis to help identify strategy that most likely leads to reaching our goal. A decision tree has a root and it has branches with leaves on it. Traversing from the root to a leaf is controlled by these classification rules. A branch represents an outcome of a test and a leaf node represents a class label, that category of, um, that we're trying to predict. These are one of our most commonly used classification algorithms. They're really computationally efficient for both training and testing phases, although they can, um, they can take a long time to fit. They're very human friendly for interpreting the results. In some cases, they're not very um, accurate, but one of the problems with decision trees and random forests, uh, well, with decision trees in particular is overfitting. So we can, give our computer our data, we can fit a decision tree on it, and then we, if we give it enough time, it can perfectly classify the data. But that classification won't necessarily generalize to new results. 
So to back off on that overfitting, we commonly prune our trees. We make these decisions, uh, these branches shorter in order to uh, generalize. Let me show you another example of this. And again, this is from the uh, data science handbook here. So this is available online for free here. This just gives us some nice visuals. So here's an example of a decision tree. And you've probably already used some process like this. It's like that game of 20 questions, right? I'm thinking of something. What am I thinking of? Are you thinking of the animal? Yes. How big is the animal? Is the animal bigger than a bread box? Yes. Then we go down one branch. Does the animal have wings? Does it have two legs? Yes or no? And as we go through the different rules here, eventually end up at a classification of that animal that I'm thinking of in this example. Well, in an abstract way, let's say that we have data that looks like this. And we have data here with four different colors. Uh, I don't know if anyone's colorblind, but there's four colors here in the graph. We have a red kind of yellowish color, a kind of blue color, and a kind of purple color. Four different kinds of data on this, in this space, on this XY plane. Let's say we want to divide this up into zones that classify these data points. Well, the way a decision tree works here is that it will make a rule. So for example, here, it might make a rule splitting the Y space at this line here. So Y is greater than whatever number, let's say 10 or less than 10, and it divides the space with this rule. It's a recursive algorithm. So then the algorithm divides maybe the X space based on this rule is X greater than or less than negative one, let's say. And the algorithm keeps subdividing and subdividing the space with additional rules till eventually it arrives at a complex classification boundary. What we're trying to do is create a set of rules here that classify, classify data points into individual zones. So this is the way a decision tree works here. And we might end up with something like this some kind of complex classification boundary that puts the data points into their correct zones. Well, that's great. We've achieved our classification here, but we might have overfit to the data. This is a very specific decision boundary. This works great for this particular data set that we have, but what if we throw some more new data points on the map? Are we necessarily gonna capture them? Should there be this, these little sections of yellow or whatever it might be here in which uh, this data, data decision boundary is winding around? Maybe we've overfed, we've made a solution here that's too specific to this particular data. So we can use decision trees. They need training. We grow the tree to train them. This is uh, to, to train them. This is a potentially time consuming phase. So one thing about decision trees is they can be a little bit slow then you can start using that decision tree once you've grown it to classify your test data. That's usually pretty fast and that can help you. But as we mentioned, decision trees can be too specific for the data that you have. They can overfit to that data. So how do we protect against that? Pruning is one technique. Another technique is to use many decision trees and make an ensemble of estimators here. So the idea is that instead of just fitting one tree, we fit many trees and we maybe we give them less time to fit here, but we fit many more of them. And then we average or summarize the results in some way. There's different ways, we can, we can think of it generally as averaging, but there's different ways we can um, vote among the results to make the decision boundary. So what we end up with 
is a less specific, more generalized boundary that will generalize to new testing data in a better way. We'll get better results with new points that we throw on the map here. So an ensemble of trees is a forest. And the random in the name uh, refers to randomly selecting subsamples of the data to put into that forest. We can use random forests for both classification and regression. So in what I just showed you, uh, we did a, a classification example, but we can use random also for regression. Check uh, the data science handbook for some examples about that. Random forests are, again, a very popular technique. They can work in a lot of different situations. They can do multi-class classifications where you have features, categorical features. You don't have to normalize or scale your data for random forests, so that's another benefit of them. Downside to them is they can be slow. That's one of the downsides. There's always a trade-off. There's a, the no free lunch principle here where you have a technique that's great, but it takes comes at a cost of something else. Okay, one other, this is gonna be our last topic of the day. One other algorithm that we wanna talk about here is clustering. Clustering is uh, that idea of grouping similar observations into clusters. It's an unsupervised machine learning algorithm we define some kind of criteria that defines membership in one group and excludes it from another group. That criteria is usually something about distance. There's different clustering algorithms here, but they usually have some kind of metric of distance. How are we calculating how close the data point is to a another data point. Does it belong to a group or not belong to a group? One of the key differences between clustering and classification is that in classification, we have to know the criteria for classification. This is not the case with clustering. It's unsupervised. We don't have targets here. K-means clustering is probably something you've encountered before. It's a pretty straightforward algorithm to understand. We'll look at some graphics here to understand how it works. So I'm going to kind of split this data set with a graphic, uh, the slide here with a graphic from the machine learning handbook here. So we have data like this. We have four, uh, we have our data. And it looks like there's, you know, perhaps some groupings in the data. We want to pick out these four clusters in the data. We can do this easily in this situation by eye, but the k-means algorithm will do it automatically here. So the way that it works is it's an iterative process. First of all, the k-means algorithm throws some points on the map here. We tell it how many clusters we're going to look for. And it then throws four center points or centroids onto the map. It then looks and sees how close the data points are to those centroids, and it classifies them as a member of that cluster or not. So in this example, we've got a green centroid down here, a blue, a purple, and a yellow. The next step is looking at how close those data points are, and then uh, assigning the membership to that centroid. After that, after we've defined these clusters, we then move the centroids to be in the middle of those clusters. So the next step is we move the centroid. We update it and move it to the new center of the data. We then look at where these new centers are and we reclassify points. We say, okay, we think these points belong to this cluster, but now these points have a higher likelihood of belonging to this other cluster. So you can see in the center here, we've recolored several of the points. We then take those, 
we move to the center of the new group and we repeat the process. We now look and see, do we think a point belongs one centroid or another, et cetera. We keep uh, moving and updating until we arrive at our find. So it's an iterative process there. It keeps iterating over uh, classifying the points and moving the centroids. Inherent in that classification is this idea of distance. Euclidean distance, or the distance that a crow flies, is the most common metric, the most popular metric for defining a K means clustering, but it's not the only one we could use here. With K means, this idea of distance, obviously we want to be working with numeric values. We're going to have to map nominal values onto numeric values and we might want to scale our data as well. The algorithm is computationally intensive here, so it can be slow, but it's always going to converge. If you tell it to find four clusters, it will find four clusters. So again, this is just a further description of how it moves, calculates the mean of the points in that cluster, centroid is assigned to the mean, and repeats the process until there's no changes in the cluster assignment of points. This is a, another example of that graphic here. It's one of the fastest clustering algorithms available. It will always converge. However, it may converge to what we call a local minimum. So it may get, get stuck in between a point and uh, in between some clusters of points and not be able to get out of that. It may find a local solution that isn't necessarily the right solution here, but it will find a solution. The other thing is because of that random assignment of points at the beginning, the scattering of points here, if you run the algorithm more than one time, you might get slightly different results. You might get different cluster centroids, um, because of that initial centroid assignment. You can assess how well you've done by looking at some kind of within cluster cohesion. So the sum of squared errors in a cluster, or what's also called the within cluster inertia. So how well is our data points sticking to one cluster and distinguishing from another cluster? That's one way to analyze your k-means clustering here. But clustering is a difficult, um, it's a difficult problem. Remember with clustering, you don't have uh, targets. You don't have a solution. So there's no way of knowing if you've uncovered what we call ground truth. This is an example of clustering methods from scikit-learn again. Um, here's a description of k-means. Uh, but as you go through here, uh, the clustering uh, articles on scikit-learn, it will tell you that don't overinterpret your clustering results. We have no way, since we don't have a ground truth, we don't have a target to compare to, we have no way of knowing if we really do have three clusters or four clusters or five clusters. We set that in the k-means algorithm, we set that parameter a priori before we run the clustering. There are some metrics, silhouette scores and things like that, that we can assess to see if we found the optimal number of clustering, but it's a hard problem. Here in scikit-learn, this is another great graphic that if you are interested in clustering, shows you different algorithms of clustering and the situations in which they perform best. So again, and the traits of your data, different algorithms will perform better or worse. For instance, here in this graphic, uh, this fifth item down on the first column, this is k-means, nice cookies of data, nice blobs of data. This performs really well. We've put the data in the appropriate clusters. It looks good. But up here above these bag long forms of data, kinds of shapes of data down a little bit. It looks for this 
it looks for these shapes here, uh, these radii around the clusters, and it tries to force points into that globular form. It doesn't do so well with these kinds of situations, with this concentric data or these croissants here, right? We have to look to other algorithms, things like agglomerative or hierarchical clustering that will perform better in those kinds of situations. So it really depends on the data situation at hand. Different kinds of data will perform better or worse with different algorithms. In addition, this is a nice table because it tells you some other parameters in your clustering problem that will prompt which kind of algorithm you want to use, which kind of methodology. Are you looking for a large number? Maybe you want to use this method. Or are you looking for uh, not so many clusters? Are you not sure how many clusters you have? Some of these methods will automatically pick the number of clusters for you. Some of these methods, like dbscan here, will not force every point to a cluster. It'll leave out some point as noise. Okay, so we talked about a lot today. You, we've talked about different kinds of machine learning techniques, the whole data science process, who is the data science, what are the tasks that they do. We've covered a lot of vocabulary, uh, talked about the data science workflow, tried to run you through some examples there. So a lot to think about. Hopefully that was informative for you. When you're thinking about how to improve your models, you might think about how to tune them using uh, some of the parameters that you have in the models, like how many centers you're going to give to the k-means algorithm. Or you might go see if you can get more training data. You may want to add more features. Um, so you may decide that you don't actually have the data at hand that you need, and you need to go and out and get more data or more better data. So there are some guidelines there about how to improve your models. But again, this is very much gets to be um, a function of expertise, of knowledge, knowledge both about your data and about the field as you work with it longer and longer. So if what we've described today sounds complex, it is. There's a lot that goes into it. I hope that you had some sense of that with the uh, workflows that we looked at. So again, I think keeping this in mind, you know, we are often focused on the modeling process. We're really interested in that. We want to accomplish that, but there's all these steps that take us into that process. And those steps are really crucial. Bringing the data in, cleaning the data, make sure, making sure that it's properly encoded. Our models and our techniques that we use are based on what kind of data we have what those measures are that we're working with. So it's really important that we solve these problems upstream, that we're working with good data, that we've properly identified the data that we want to look at and it's categorized correctly, it's encoded correctly, so that we solve, so we spare ourselves headaches downstream here. Okay. This is a complex process. This is a simple diagram, but Hopefully you have a sense of all the work that goes into this now. Okay, that is all the material that we wanna share with you today. Um, JF has some uh, uh, the material to share here. And as a last uh, bit of work for you to do, make sure that you take your questions home and you think about them. Hopefully that gave you something to think about here. We'd like you to fill out a class evaluation. Um, you're going to go to this website and you're going to enter in this class code here and choose final evaluation. I want to thank you all for participating. Thank you for the questions. They were really great questions. I hope that um, this was useful to you. It provided some guidance for you, gave you some resources, things to think about. Um, so I hope that it got you further along your data science path. 
Um, we'll hang out here and answer some additional questions as they come through. But again, thank you all for attending. Um, that's it in terms of the material that we want to cover today. And again, JF is going to send out, share out some um, material here at the uh, slide sets, I believe. Okay. Thanks again, all. Um, have a great afternoon or evening. Stay healthy and safe. I'm going to stop screen sharing here. I'm going to see if I can uncover it. We'll see what see how the video goes. It might just break down. Nope. Can't do that anymore. Okay. So thank you again for participating and um, uh, have a great afternoon. Stay healthy and safe and hope to see you again soon.